It would be it would be so fucking sick if we both top forward on Florian and Rob. That is my dream. That is my fantasy for this weekend. Welcome back to Blue is a Crutch. I mean, colors are a crutch. Uh, my name is Max Sterberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined by my Rakdos brethren, the Florian man for today, Max B. How you doing? Dude, I am doing ridiculously good. <laughs> ridiculously good. I am floating. I'm feeling amazing. We fucking did it, dude. We fucking did it. Shot called. We did it. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before, yeah. before we jump into anything, just to remind everyone, we are sponsored by Eminence Gaming. Um, they're the ones who make the CDH community go. They're the engine. Uh, and we love you guys. So shout out to them. Want to host the best CDH events in the world? I got the right software for you. Eminence Gaming and the Command Tower software. You want to be a TO? Have easy access to decklist submissions, player management, and just a few clicks of a button. And if your players want to see what they need, all they need to do is scan one QR code and they have access to the bracket page. This will show them their live pairings and live round results so they can be updated on how they're doing in the tournament. Make your tournament the best that it could possibly be with the Command Tower software. What a weekend, man. What are we, what are we, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so there, there may be some people who who are new and, and, and haven't heard all of our podcasts up to this point, but... Um, should I give the foundation? Yeah, why don't, story? why don't you tell the story and then and then no. okay. Yeah, go for it. Many moons ago <laughs> <laughs> Max P decided to build this card called this commander named Florian because of some bet with a buddy, I think, yep. or something a long yep. time ago. Uh and he had a lot of success on this trash commander. Uh to the point that he was known as the Florian guy. Um, and it's a, it's a good tech. It's not a trash commander. It's a very good tech. But so he submitted it to the decklist database five times. And of those five times, he was accepted zero times with the reasoning that they do not want to put another Rakdos Turbo Nas deck on the database. Flash forward some number of months is the spoil of Obnixilus Captive Kingpin. I am not a turbo player. I am a control player. And my buddy back from Massachusetts hit me up when Omnixus was spoiled and said, this is the one, you are brewing this with me, I need your help on this one. And I said, okay, fine. And so I brewed Omnixus with him, uh, we we cooked, we cooked really hard, I did a lot of playtesting, I did a lot of cooking on that deck, and it got to a pretty, pretty good place that I felt like it was actually a solid CDH deck. <laughs> and then I, uh, when the next database update was coming around, I was like, yeah, I'll submit it, see what happens. And, uh... I was accepted as the newest Rakdos Turbo Nas deck on the database, which gave me the ability to meme on Max and Florian for months, uh, which is one of my favorite things to do, as I'm sure you have literally, heard if you are a longtime listener of this show. Literally constantly. a foundation of this <laughs> podcast is him memeing on me. Like literally that's like half of who we are at this point. <laughs> Is Obnixilus memeing on Florian, yeah. correct. Uh, to the point that it is it is the art that is in our playmat that is coming out soon, which now that art is like even better <laughs> given what has happened. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've, we've, we've had a friendly, a very friendly rivalry of Obnixilus versus Florian for quite a while now. And for some amount of that time, Max has been saying to me, go play Ob in a tournament. Go prove it's a good deck. If you think it's a good deck, if you think it's better than Florian, show you can top 16 on it. And I said repeatedly, I would like you to play Florian, put on your big fucking, put on your big boy pants again, pick up Florian, get off of your blue Italian bullshit, and we go play Florian versus Obnixilus in the same meta, in the same tournament, and we see who does better as a way to figure out what deck, what deck is better. And for weeks, he told me to go fuck myself. Those, and those for exact weeks, words, I yeah, told him to, exactly those words, to yeah. stop being a little bitch. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and so for weeks, we, we we did this back and forth of me trying to talk him into playing Florian again and him telling me to just go play off. And <clears throat> I won that battle uh, because finally this, <laughs> this, this past week, I convinced this man to agree to play Florian for Mox Masters January and I would play my first ever tournament not on Kinnon. I've played one small, like, 19-person local yeah, event on yeah, Yidris, yeah. but, like, my first my first ever real tournament that I give a shit that I was going to play on not Kinnon, a 140-person event, Mox Masters January. And all week, 
This entire week was Max constantly trying to bitch out of doing this. So stressed. And constantly saying how much he didn't want to do this anymore. And me saying, stop it. You're going to do fine. I'll see you in the finals. Um, yeah, those 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 and, who know me and those who and those so who practiced it. with me during the week, like leading up to this, I was crying like a little baby the whole time. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I'd rather be playing Italian. I'm not ready. I haven't practiced enough. You know, there's too much pressure. Like just crying and crying and crying and like looking for ways to get out of it. Like you know, I was hoping my wife would say no, maybe a little bit. Like, you know, just just total stress to the point where like max and i even like had a little like mini falling out in the middle of the night one night because i was just so stressed about it and we made up everything's fine <clears throat> i wouldn't call it a falling out i would call it you aggressively berating me and me forgiving yeah that's, that's fine that's accurate that's accurate that's accurate but uh, but yeah we, we worked it out, me and, worked uh, it out. Me, and, me and holly had a wonderful conversation uh, for anyone who's curious uh yeah you know what I did in advance is I I scheduled childcare for Max's children with a local babysitter, so then Holly could have just no excuses to let my daddy sit. <laughs> but yeah, but but yeah, but spoiler alert: we we both played. We did it. We we both went. We we did end up playing. We both played Rakdos decks. Should we not spoil how we did yet? Oh uh, no, I think we just fucking. I mean, we can we can lay it out like um you know, we both made top four. Um of this 140 person event with the exact with the exact same record and not only did we not only did we end up with the exact same record but we both died in the finals at the exact same time it was yes. it, it was it was spectacular <laughs> it was spectacular it was it was a, it was a very good weekend. It was it was a really good accomplishment. It was super cool to call the shot and I mean even we'll, we'll get into it but like round 4 we ended up up against each other. Yeah. Um, we agreed to the ID. Pretty much we were saying, we were like, we would both feel so bad if we knocked one of the other people out of top 16. So we were like, let's just ID this one. And the other people were down. Max was on the play for this game. And I mean, Ashani came in as the caster and was like, please play this game for the stream. We want the story. And we were like, no, we will we will settle this in top four. Yeah, and we, we, and we, 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 uh, we were true to our word. True to our word, made yeah. it to top four. So, you know, we got a lot to talk about because, you know, we got a lot of rounds to sort of go through and some crazy, crazy plays that we both had in multiple rounds that we got to get through. Um, there were some shenanigans around draws that we have to address, um, you know, and it's just it was it was just an amazing weekend. So, um, I mean, I think we're just going to jump into it. Um, we'll go back and forth, I guess, you know, take our, you know, you could talk first and I talk second and we could just go back and forth through each round. Um, until we get to the part where we're sure. ha telling the same story, because that's going to happen. Do you? Would you like to go first? I can go first because my 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 round one was for it. incredibly easy to talk about. So, um, sure. You know, I I you know I, I left the first round going. Oh, I hope this isn't the rest of the day because um, I was going fourth seat. I had to mull down to a pretty obnoxious five, um, but it was you know I had to keep it. Um, and in first seat was Tevish Krom. Um, I go to my turn. You know, nothing crazy happens in the first sweep. Um, I play a City of Traitors, I play a Grim Monolith, and I play two Talismans and pass. Uh, Tevish Krom untaps, plays a Dockside, casts an Adnaz, good game. And that was it. Never got a second turn. Easy peasy. <laughs> you know, cast three spells and that was the game. Um, so not a whole lot more to say about that other than like the Tevish Krom player, like did a great job. You know, congratulations, you know, good win. That's it. That's all I got for round one. What about you? Yeah, my round one, I don't even, like, remember. I didn't have too much going on. I think I kept the, like, kind of slow hand that I regretted. Oh, I remember what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my round one went very, very long. We had uh, Juggernaut on Blue Farm, who was in your top 16 game on the play, on the play for my round one. Uh, going into Brick Squad on Kenrith in seat two, going into a guy on Marnius in seat three, and myself on Obnixilis in seat four. I think I kept a hand of like six in this game. Um, that was kind of just like a turn one Ragavan hand of just like, all right, let's try and just like build a little slow mana production. It was like a hand that was very, very medium, but I didn't quite want to put back. And so I ended up going with it just being in fourth seat. I didn't, you know, I would love to mull for a dockside there, but it just wasn't quite where I was at. Um, the game the game progressed in like a very very awkward fashion where Blue Farm was in an incredible lead pretty much the entire time 
where you know they were able to set up just like a lot of value engines they had their draws they had the one ring like they, they were just in this very dominant position kenrith in second seat really wasn't doing too much marnius was just kind of like interacting at weird times out of third seat i didn't really agree with some of his choices um and then i was in fourth seat i think i ended up like top decking a mana crypt so i was able to get ob out again or something similar um i had dark ritual so i was able to do it again pretty quickly uh, I think that's what it was. I think I had the Dark Rit. Um, my Ragavan was sniped before I like got a single attack with it by a Bowmasters at a blue farm, so I, I didn't get anything out of there. And I remember being a little confused because I wouldn't have had a pathway to attack, most likely, if it got back to me there, and I don't think I ended up with a pathway. And he didn't hit the Ignoble Hierarch out of Kenrith, or whatever dork he had there. He chose to just hit my Ragavan, which I was a little, I was a little surprised by, given that I was in fourth seat, I had the lowest maul, I had the worst board state, and like not hitting the man dork there was a little surprising on the Bowmaster. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this game progressed in a way where I end up with a Kessig fire, uh, Kessig flame breather on the battlefield for what was my last turn. And we're in a position that we know we lose to blue farm on the next turn. I'm in third, I'm in fourth seat, goes into blue farm after this, you know, my, my turn is like right near the end of time on the clock. And I, uh, the turn before that turn, so, uh, Marnius's turn right before my final turn. He casts that blue human pirate thing from Ixalan that turns one of each person's things into a treasure token. Um, and very importantly, there was an opposition agent already in the battlefield. And so he hit my Obnixilus. He hit the Wish Claw out of Blue Farm that Blue Farm couldn't even use. And he hit the Soul Ring from Kenrith. So the only thing on the battlefield that he hit that mattered in any way was my Obnixilus. And again, we are like clearly losing to Blue Farm on blue farms next turn so i start my turn with an abrade targeting the human pirate thing and he decides to pact of negation it mm. which i was shocked by because like i have like very few cards in hand i do not have much going on i have like two cards in exile i have like i'm i'm in no way expecting to win this turn that seems almost impossible to me but i'm but i'm also just confused because i'm like the ob is the only thing that's stopping it's not like I'm in any shot to kill you. Obviously, if I go for anything, when you can hold back the pact navigation and unlocking the wish claw from Blue Farm didn't matter because there was an oppo. So like none of that mattered. It was only stopping me. So it was very confusing that he was willing to use a pact there when you know we're losing to the next person so clearly. Um, so the pact resolves. I'm like, okay, I end up having to sacrifice Mob Nixilus as a treasure to be able to recast him and hold up like just a couple of mana from that point. Um, and I had a Wheel of Misfortune in hand. And by the way, the, the Marnius player also played a Blowmasters at this point. And Kenrith had a Mystic Remora. Okay. So he's drawing on everything I'm casting, every random thing. And we end up in this position that I have four mana floating. I have exactly four mana. And I reveal, I say, I have this Wheel of Misfortune. You know, and by the way, the Blue Farm player is at six life at this point. He has the One Ring protection for this turn at this time. So we're not able to hit him with the Bowmaster Trickers. But he has the One Ring that he's going to take one from. He has a Mana Vault he's going to take one from. And if he loses his Mana Crypt roll, it takes him down to one life from his six life total at the current time on his next turn. And I have a Kessig Flame Breeder on board. And so I show the Wheel of for Misfortune and I say, like, look, if I hit any instant spell that I can cast here, like, I can kill him and this game will go to a draw. And so I cast the Wheel of Misfortune. And the Kenrith player draws a Mystic Remora. There is a Bowmaster trigger, and he decides to kill my Kessig Flame Breather. <sighs> and I was like, I have, I have, I have one mana floating after this wheel. I have one mana floating. There is, there is no, there is no reasonable way that I find any line to win the game here. Like I'm sure there is some nutty combination of seven that I could draw. But again, we are deterministically dead already that we know to the Blue Farm player. It's a Wheel of Misfortune, not a Wheel of mis not a Wheel of Fortune. So he's keeping his like 15 card hand, and and we know we're losing to that. So I was I was shocked that he made the decision to kill my Kessig. It really made no sense to me. And I did draw into a zero cost instant. That would have meant that I could have killed him in his upkeep because he did lose his mana crypt roll and he did go to one life and then was able to literally like hit the, the, the game went to time five seconds after my turn ended. Um, and so it would have just been game is at time. Cool. I'm going to cast this. I, I forget if it was a slaughter pack or a deadly relic. I, I'm going to cast this spell you're dead and that's yeah, the game draw. and we would have just gone to a draw um but instead he decided to ob obliterate everything i had going on for no reason which was confusing and then uh we lost to blue farm obviously because blue farm had a 15 card hand and all of us were tapped out and could do nothing so yeah. Yeah. pretty easy um and that was that was my round one so it was a little frustrating like i i have i have i never have any qualms with losing good games like a good game of magic if i lose fucking absolutely no problem i love a good game of magic but when it's like really confusing 
almost like nonsensical decisions because I've even I've talked to a few people about the game and like no one has been able to give me because I, I do ask people I'm like am I am I just like missing something here what is the thought process like why would these person would this person make these plays why would he pack to the abrade why would he kill my Kessie flame breather like we, we are so aware that these are the obvious outs in this game what is the reasoning behind it and it, it's honestly kind of nonsensical to me I'm not trying to sound salty like I don't really care but I'm just like I'm confused and I don't get the plays and yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't it's, understand the thought it, process it, on it's, either it's of tough those. I mean for a lot of people you're playing in a tournament setting and it's high stress and high pressure and you make mistakes like you make the wrong call and you you know assess threats wrong I mean I do it everyone does it you know? yeah. so you know I mean, but I explained all of this to him. Yeah. When I when I cast the wheel and he was like about a point the bonus trigger, I was like, You realize this is our out. Like I explained it very yeah. clearly. I said the life totals, I said what this gets to, I said this is our out to kill him. Like this yeah. is obviously our only out in this game yeah, at this he point. Fucked up. Just, he fucked up. Know, yeah, no he sense. fucked up. But yeah, it and happens. Blue Farm happens. untaps, cast Grand Abolisher, and you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Easy money. Yeah. Yeah. GG's. So that was a game. So I was like, okay. I was like, whatever from that one. Um and then we we go to round two. Tell us about tell us about your yeah, round. So, two. you know, I left round one going, I hope this isn't the rest of the day. I hope this isn't how it works. And I go to round two. Fortunately in second seat, uh, instead of fourth this time, which I love second seat, especially on Florian. I love getting a gemstone caverns. I didn't get a gemstone caverns, but I got a, a pretty solid hand. Um, you know, it was a fast Florian and it was a um a deflecting swat and a bolus of citadel and a bunch of other stuff that didn't matter. Um, you know, played the game, was getting good triggers off of Florian, building a good board state, um, you know, but but staying under the radar, nothing too flashy. And this was a game where I was determined to be patient because they were the other the other three decks were, let me see real quick, I'll tell you who they were. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so it, it was me and me in, in second seat. Um, we had Dargo Thrasios in first seat. We had Paco and Halden in third seat, and we had Kinnon, your boy Kinnon, uh, in in fourth seat. So you know, three three blue decks, um, you know, with a scary commander in in Paco and Halden because you know if, if Paco gets big enough, you know, you could just put me out of the game. Um, so I was really determined to play a patient game, not be the threat, um, take my time, and build prote a protected state where I could win from. Um, so that's exactly what I did. I had that deflecting swat. I went and tutored at one point for a conqueror's flail, um, but didn't cast it. Just like played under the radar, um, waited for someone to take their first attempt at winning. Um, I believe that was Dargo Thrasius took a, took a win attempt, put a win attempt on the stack, um, mm -hmm. and got stopped by the entire table. Um, at the end of that, at the very end of that, um, he actually would have won the war and gotten the win attempt through. Um, at which point I finally stopped sandbagging and cast my D SWAT to, to settle the uh, settle the stack, right? So mm -hmm. at that point <laughs> I get I, go, I get to go to my turn, um, but on his end step I cast a Vamp Tutor, and I go and get myself a Dockside. Um, wait, 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 one yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. You on Florian and Rakdos sandbagging a D SWAT? I've never heard of you I doing know, this. Wild, right? Like off, <laughs> completely abnormal. I would never. There's no way yeah. this happens again <laughs> at any point in this tournament. <laughs> the, whole, the whole time this is happening, like like you know the, the the counter war happened. Some you know Dargo casts a counter on the counter, and they go, Max, do you have anything? I'm like, I'm playing Rakdos, and then another another counter happens. You know, Max, do you have anything? I'm playing Rakdos. So finally, they stop a a asking me, right? And he goes, Oh well, we we don't have anything else. I'm like, Okay, fine, deflecting SWAT. And everyone's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, you know, Leave me alone. Uh, what do you want from this? me? So it settles the stack war. Yeah. I, I cast a vamp tutor. I go and I get my dock side. I get back to my turn. I start my turn with um, uh, the Conqueror's Flail. Um, I get the mm -hmm. dock side on board. I create a bunch of treasures. Um, I attach the uh, Conqueror's Flail to the dock side, in this case. Um, I mm -hmm. cast my Bolus of Citadel. No one has anything left at this point, right? Um, and I just win. I just go from there. I yeah. play off the top of my library till I hit win. a Sensei's Divining Top, and then, you know, and then I hit a, mm -hmm. a, a an Imp Imperial Seal at some point. Put Aetherflux on top. Mm -hmm. Cast Aetherflux, and then, I'm like, guys, can we? Are we good? And that was it. Are we good. Was it chilling? We did chilling? Yeah, no, that works. That works. Also, one of my favorite lines now that, like, because people are so into, like, do you have anything for this? Fishing for information constantly. Whether I have anything or don't have anything at this point, a lot of times I respond with, if you have an answer to this, I recommend you use it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, but. but I, and they could say, well, yeah, but do you have anything to back me up? And I would say, if you have an answer. <laughs> See, my, this, I my, my answer is just, it. my answer is always, I'm, <laughs> I'm playing Rakdos. Like, which doesn't mean I don't have an don't answer. It just questions. means I'm. 
Yeah. Well, are you serious? Ask You're asking question. me for an answer? I'm playing Rakdos. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you come to me, a demon daddy, on the day of this win at them, and ask me to deal with something for you? Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> We're going to get to my top 16 game. I was just telling them, I was like, I'm not your police. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so we'll game, game two is pretty straightforward. Like I, like I, I'm proud of the way I played. I was very patient. I did not try to force anything early. There were, there were moments where I could have tried to be the first one to win. And I knew that if I did that, I was going to get blown out. So I just waited, just built the, built the stack of protection and just waited for my moment and hit it and worked. So very happy with it dude it was good good and then it, i felt man. like the, you know anything was possible from there i'm like oh you know maybe i can do this maybe once it you, can happen yeah, once you get the first one it yeah. feels good we both we both won our, our round twos very quickly. yeah <laughs> in terms of total yeah time. you you were a little faster I I was ahead yeah of you, you beat me by like 20 minutes i was, I think, I right? was fast yeah. on this one yeah no i was i was quick i mean this was like the the, the perfect my, my round two is the perfect stereotypical everyone taps out for draw engines get fucked um <laughs> i went like I think I literally went like turn one. I forget if I, I, oh yeah, oh yeah, this was gas. So my hand that I kept in round two, which by the way, my my round two pod was, um, it was, what was this deck? Okay, so it was myself on the play, Throb Dixilis on the play. We had Magda in second seat and we had Najila in, or sorry, myself on the play, Sauron in second seat, Magda in third seat, Najila in fourth seat. Uh, Schlob Daddy got a decent hand where it was just like a quick ad nauseum hand. And I was like, down on the play. Schnoz for me, I'm down with this. And my turn one top deck was Jeweled Lotus. And I was like, oh, sounds good. We get both plans. Sounds great. <laughs> so, I, so I just go like lay him Jeweled Lotus up. I might have even had a Mox Diamond too. And I, I played out a Hope of Gear Purr on like turn turn one or turn two. I don't remember which turn it was. But I ended up playing a Hope of Gear Purr. I might have hit the Hope of Gear Purr on an Ob Trigger actually. I just got like a couple generic Ob Triggers. Like my hand wasn't on the Ob plan at all. It was on the Nas plan. So I didn't really care. But like just topping the Jeweled Lettuce made me seem like I was on the Ob plan, which also kind of like gets the scent off of the Nas plan, which is super good. Uh, really quickly, I mean, Najila had a turn one Mystic Remora, where I'm immediately like, let's be responsible. <laughs> Let's let's be let's be chill, guys. Let's be chill. And then pretty quickly, I think it was uh, turn turn three. Uh, Sauron and Second Seat had a One Ring on the stack, and they resolved it. And then the Gila immediately goes for a Phyrexian Metamorph to copy the One Ring. Um, and then I oh yeah, so that was on like that was on there. That was the turn two, turn three cycle. So then they lose the protection. So I'm like, I can't go over anything right now because of protection. I have the Hope of Gearper. So I just like used it the previous turn, and it's really nice when you when you attack with Hope of Gear Purr and you do not sacrifice it, it like gives people this little vote of confidence that you're not ready to go for it. So it was really nice that I like attacked with Hope of Gear Purr the previous turn before I went through it, and they saw me not sack it, so they're like, okay, we're good for now. And so then the following turn, what it was, I believe, my turn four, um, the Najila has a Mystic Remora in the One Ring, Sauron has a One Ring, Magda's starting to look scary, no interaction has been used, absolutely none at all. And I'm just like... They've all kind of tapped out for draw engines here. I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to schnoz. <laughs> and, so was, and so I was like, it's and so I was like, time. okay, go to combat, swing, swing Hope of Gear Perret and Ajila, because they're the one with the Mystic Remora. Uh, do that. And then I was like, okay, I'm, I would like to sacrifice Hope of Gear Perret. <laughs> Get silenced. And then I um then I just tap for a, a Schnad nauseum and they all passed on it. And I say, had nausea resolved? Sick. And this was oh, such a clean nausea. Was that like 38 life? And so I just, I went down to like six and I hit literally everything. Like I just, I had, I, I hit several mana rocks, several rituals. I think I had breach. I had like three tutors. Like it was, it was clean. It was a very good Nas. And it, you know, I love, I love when you silence someone and as you're casting all these spells, they say, oh, if I wasn't silenced, I could do something about it. And I'm like, yes, that is the, the point. <laughs> that That's is, the idea. That is why That's you are silenced why I used that time. card. That was yep. the, that was the yep. idea. So yeah, I did like the stereotypical, you guys all tapped out for value draw engines and then I just won the game, which I think is what you're supposed to do when you're the turbo player. That's what I've been learning. Welcome. Uh, that's even like what I've done on Kinnon. Welcome I, like, to Rakdos, baby. Welcome. Fucking, yeah, everyone's just like, Ristic Study, Mystic Grimoire, Ristic Study. I'm like, all right, Basalt. Yeah. <laughs> I do not want to wait. <laughs> like, I'm not going to wait. <laughs> like, what do yeah. you mean? Um, but yeah, so that one was, that one was a really clean win. That one felt really good. It was, it, yeah, it was like, it was like 15, 20 minutes into the round. It was, it was pretty fast. Um, were you on stream for that one? You were not good. on stream for that one. You were on stream for... No, I wasn't on stream. I wasn't on stream until the finals. Oh, wow. tournament. They tried to get us on the stream for our top 16 game, but there were too many spectating. people illegally yeah, spectating yeah, yeah, yeah. the game. 
Uh, so they were they were unable unable to get into the stream. Um, but yeah, so my my round two was fun. It felt really good. That was my first time ever nozzing in a tournament. It was pretty cool to resolve a Nas. Just like, oh yeah, we, we turns out that's line. a good that card, good. doesn't it? And Nas isn't bad. Turns out, turns out Nas is a good card, my guy. And then we we go to round three. Yeah, round three, I was on stream, um, and I had no idea, which is which is a good thing because I, I feel like when I'm I know I'm on stream, I think I play a little worse just because I get a little nervous, right? Um, I had no idea the entire time. I didn't know until afterwards. But what was cool is in between rounds, you know, we were hanging out on the Colors Are a Crutch Discord in voice chat, just hanging out. Um, and a couple of people joined us, you know, hanging out with us while we were there, uh, including uh, the guy who I ran up against in my round three, which was, I'm going to call you out, dude. Tropical yeah, Coffee. Tropical Coffee. Uh, who is on this, by the way, really sick, uh, interesting Galadriel deck. Um, I highly recommend people check it out. We'll put a link to it in the description. Um, but I was in wah, 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 fourth seat. Um, you know, and I'm like, here we go again. Um, but I got a really, what I consider to be one of my favorite um, Florian hands. And that was, I had a top deck tutor. I had a vampir vampiric tutor. I had my one of my favorite cards in the deck, Memnite, and I had Goblin Welder, and I had a Chromox, and I had um, or, uh, I didn't have a Chromox. I had, and I had a couple of lands, and that was basically it, right? But mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't know, that's a yeah, that's a win. If you don't know, that's a that's a quick set. That's a, that's a that is a quick set. Yeah, and I had it backed up. I, I had, <laughs> the last card I had was a Pyroblast. I had a Pyroblast as well, just to back everything up. So um, you know, I'm like, all right. Um, you know, I'm gonna play nice and like cool under the radar here. I go land, Memnite, uh, Goblin Welder, pass, and I kind of like look there. Look, you know, like looks pretty weak board state. Got you know, land sitting there, look two little creatures. I'm like, well, well, um, and everyone else is developing these crazy board states. You know, we've got Aristic Study, we've got, you know, we've got uh, Galadriel played a uh, God. What is that card called? Charismatic Conqueror. Francisco. Charismatic Conqueror. Oh yeah, Charismatic Conqueror. Is yeah, good. so Char so really so he played Charismatic Conqueror. So he's played that, and he's just like creating vampires from everything. So so in any case, you know, board states are being developed. Um, it's going to be turn three, um, and uh, at this point, uh, Galadriel has like like six or seven vampires on board. He's got nice mana development. Uh, Malcolm Kettis. Oh, I didn't even say like. I didn't even say who was at the, at the pod, but the pod was in first seat Galadriel, in second seat Kenrith, and in third seat Malcolm Kettis, right? So everyone's developed a good board state. Malcolm and Kettis is in play. He's created a bunch of treasures, but he's letting them come intact because he doesn't want to give a million vampires uh, over to Galadriel because that's kind of a, a funny interaction. If you have Malcolm Kettis and you're creating lots of treasures, you're also creating lots of vampires. And with, with Galadriel, it, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your turn, you have three choices, and you can choose one that hasn't been chosen that turn. One of them is to scry to and then draw a card, I believe. So like, if you are giving them one trigger every turn, they are drawing an extra card every turn that are actually one of three cards. So it's really good selection, like very, very powerful synergy. And then the other ones are like mana and counters. Well, the ca um, but like the card draw specifically for some. Well, in this case, the counter was really, really scary because, you know, the the yeah, pile the, of vampires the, the he didn't hit first of all he did not have galadriel on the battlefield yet which was key um but he was creating a, a okay. zillion vampires just lots and lots of vampires coming down um and if if he gets galadriel on the battlefield and gives them all plus one plus one um you know someone's dying <laughs> like someone's gonna die immediately um so everyone was starting to respect that um you know really respect the charismatic conqueror and not wanting to get you know completely blown out um so everyone's being careful Oh my god! It's each creature you correct. Control? Correct. Each creature you control gets plus I one. I thought it was. One. I thought it was target no, creature. No, 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 I did no. not realize it was each. Yeah, creature. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. That's actually terrifying. Yeah, yeah we were yeah. all staring. We were oh, all sitting there shit. staring down the barrel of the gun at that point. Like, oh, we we're all shit. like, "Oh my god!" You know, we're gonna die. Um, but yeah, you know, okay. but I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not gonna go crazy. I'm gonna play it nice and cool. I don't want to be the target. So I'm, I'm trying to stay under the radar. Um, I think at that point, you know, the, the sheer threat of all of those vampires, you know, was starting to put pressure on the table. Uh, and Kenrith had uh, Thassa's Oracle and Ancient Pact in hand. So he made the decision to go for it. Um, you know, and at this point, he had a couple uh, a couple of spells to protect it with. So it made sense for him to try, I guess. You know, but, you know, my feeling is never be the first one to go for it. Um, but he does anyway. He goes for it. Um, and he gets stopped. 
Um, you know, and I have, I'm sitting there on that Pyroblast. I could have Pyroblasted the Thassa's Oracle, but you know, I could tell just by the way that people were responding and talking at the table uh, that I didn't have to. I knew other people had interaction and I was perfectly cool to pass priority on the Thassa's Oracle immediately, uh, let someone else counter the, the Tainted Pact. And I just sat there quietly with my Pyroblast in reserve in case I absolutely had to do something. Uh, I mean, really, really good thing there. If you're playing in person or on spell table and someone puts a Thassa's Oracle on the stack and you're like first in priority with a Pyroblast on a Rakdos deck, that type of situation, my immediate thing is the body language of how they grab for the 100%. Hand. 100%. You know? Yep. Yeah. And, and not only that, but the way they pass on it. Like in this case, I was second in priority mm -hmm. order. Uh, so so Kedis was like, I pass on Thassa's Oracle. And you could hear in like just the tone of his voice, he wasn't he oh. was not going to lose at that point. He wasn't gonna lose yeah. to a resolve Thassa's Oracle. I'm like, yeah, I'm Rakdos. You know, same action I always give. <laughs> I pass. Um, you know, they, they do the fight. I don't actually have to use the Pyroblast. Like they they win the fight without it. And I'm like, awesome. Now I'm gonna get to go to my turn with the Pyroblast. So um Kedis takes his turn, does some damage. Um, creates some treasures that he puts into play tapped for the most part. Holds up uh, two, I believe, two treasures untapped and two lands untapped. So I'm like, okay, he's got, he's got some more. He's got some more. But I could sort of tell. Like I don't, I, I don't really know how I can explain this, but you know, I had a very strong feeling that the interaction he had um, was something for non-creatures. I mean, that, first of all, that's you know usually the case. Um, but I just, I could just, mm -hmm. I could just tell just by the way the interaction. Uh, you know, un unfolded in the previous turn. Like I'm, I know, I'm pretty sure I knew what he had. Um, so I cast a Vamp Tutor, and I do my best to sort of, you know, feign like, well, I got to come up with something here because I'm like way behind, right? And it, you know, they're like, yeah, cool, you you can resolve your Vamp Tutor. He wasn't worried, right? I go Vamp Tutor, and mm -hmm. I put a Goblin Engineer on top of my library because this is apps. Which yeah, this is one of my favorite Florian lines, right? Because if you don't know what Goblin Engineer does, Goblin Engineer, when it ETBs, I get to search my library for any artifact and put it into my graveyard, All right? And then I can also pay one red and tap it, and I can bring back an artifact from the graveyard, trading it with an artifact already on the field, <clears throat> but that artifact of the graveyard has to be three mana or less. But I don't care about that because I already have a Goblin Welder on the battlefield that can bring back any artifact in exchange for an artifact on the battlefield. And I have my handy dandy mm -hmm. little Memnite sitting there, right? So I untap for turn. I draw my Goblin Engineer and I just slam it. And which very very important line here because like a lot of people would say, oh, it's more mana efficient to just go for in tomb. But uh, there's a difference between a tomb and Goblin Engineer in the fact that one of them gets countered by fucking every counter spell in the format, and one of them is kind of hard to hit. Yep, 100. percent Now I, I had to gamble a little bit here because I had a land in hand. Um, and I could play my land for turn first, and then I get to hold up the Pyroblast while I, cap, while I cast the Engineer. But the problem with that is, is then I've played my land drop for turn, and if there's a land on top of my library, then Bolus of Citadel basically does nothing, right? It's a brick, right? So I don't play my land, I just slam the Engineer and hope for the best. But I was pretty confident that it was gonna resolve. Like they just didn't have, you know, just the way that the turn unfolded and the way that I had, you know, like, like it's just, I had a good feeling that it was gonna be fine. And sure enough, result. Um, at that point, everyone at the table started to freak out a little bit. Um, you know, they you know they wanted to, there was a uh, an Archivist of Ogma in play uh, on Galadriel's board. Uh, and there was a trigger to uh, get his search and his gain one life thing. Um, but I didn't let that resolve. I responded to it by activating the Welder, swapping the the Memnite and the, the Bolus of Citadel, putting it right into play, and just immediately started playing cards off the top of my library. Um, mm -hmm. and from there, it, it just got really ugly, really fast. I started off with like, um, I don't remember what it was like a Dothy. I played a couple of different things. Um, and then I got to, um, a horn of Hanfell, the reverse side of Burgi. Um, and I cast the reverse side of Burgi, pay my five life. And at that point, the guy looks at his hand. I know he's got that non-creature counter spell. And he's like, I need to use this. Like, this is the time, right? This is the time. And I'm like, well, I don't win with this. That's what I said. I said, I, I mean, I can't win with this. You might want to save it for what I try to win with. Did he not counter the horn? He let the horn resolve. Ah, <laughs> uh, the horn makes the citadel unwhiffable, my guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so horn, horn resolves. 
Um, and the next card I, I, you know, the next card on top of my library is a land. The card after that is a land. The card after that is a land. Right, and I know that. Oh, he would have got you. He would have got you. Fucking counter the horn. Oh my god. Oh so, shit. Oh yeah. So, I, there's no, there's no world I let that horn resolve there, bro. There's no way. Yeah. So, I, so I go and I and I discard and uh, I discard a couple of cards, and I hit, uh, um, you know, I hit those lands. Then I hit, um, yeah, I hit, I hit Tibble's trickery. I hit Tibble's mm-hmm. trickery, and I hit. Um, yeah, Tibble's Trickery is the important one. I hit Tibble's Trickery, um, and then I, I, uh, and then I hit Breach. I play Breach off the top of my library, and then the guy's like, "Okay, well now I need to interact, right?" But now I have access to a <laughs> to a Tibble's Trickery, so he, yeah. so he, so he attempts. I have a Tibble's Trickery, and I also have the Pyroblast still sitting in my hand, just as backup. Um, so he casts the, uh, you know, cast the Fierce Guardianship that he was sandbagging. Um, you know, it was kind of funny because right after the next card after breach on my library was a deadly relic. So I could have killed, uh, the Kedis that was still left. And then he wouldn't have, mm-hmm. he would not have been able to even fierce guardianship at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but in any case, I, I, uh, yeah, I play the, I play the breach. Um, I cast vampiric tutor from my graveyard. I put top on top of my library. Um, I play the top. I cast the Vampiric Tutor from my graveyard again. I put Aether Flux on top, and that's it. Light lights out. Um, you, but you will say I've had a lot of games where like I'm starting to go off on a storm turn, and I'll hit something like a Deadly Relic from Exile, and there will be a creature that's probably like, oh, a better thing to hit on the board. I just start hitting. Oh, hundred percent. And people are always like, why are you hitting my commander? And I'm like, hundred percent. Gonna hit your thrust. Hundred percent. And early in the turn, you know, there, there are a few details like I missed. Like I think I hit it like a lightning bolt. Use the lightning bolt to kill the Malcolm, and then I use the deadly relic to kill the Kedis. So at that point, the only com- there's no commanders left on the board at that point. Um, yeah. So I felt pretty good at that point going forward, and then it just it was just you know snowballed from there pretty pretty quickly. You know, top 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 Aetherflux, good game. Yep, yep. easy money. easy peasy. It felt so good. Um, and I even showed my kids the game because it's so funny to watch that winning turn. So I start the turn. I have land, land, Memnite, Welder. And everybody else has like yep. ten things on board, and I and I showed my kids. I'm like, who's gonna win this game? Who's gonna lose this game? And they're like, Dad, you're you're out, dude. You you lost this game clearly. Mm-hmm. There's no. And then I, that's one of the ones where you you have to know to know. You know what I mean? Like like if I see that board sit and you cast the vamp tutor, I'm like, oh, you're getting Citadel to the yard. Like I know that immediately. But if you don't know, it looks so innocuous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was so sweet. Very very sweet win. Whole thing on stream. I'll put the the link to it. In the description below, There's, they actually have a YouTube video of it up right now uh, that you can go see. So mm-hmm. I'll put it up there. And that was it, you know. Yeah, did you see our finals game? Our finals game is three hours and That's one insane. minute. <laughs> On the YouTube. I, don't, I, don't, I can't watch it again. I just can't. <laughs> it hurts me. Uh, I've already watched it. I've already watched <laughs> yeah. it again. It, it, hurt, it hurts, dude. It hurts. It hurts. When my breach was countered, it, it hurt. It hurt. Yeah. Um, but my, that was my round three. Felt really yeah. good about it. Like went, you know, took a nice... Uh, Took a nice walk, relaxed. You know, you had already won like 20 minutes ago, so you, of course, were memeing on me about how much faster Ob wins. No, no, I think you, I think you, I think you were faster than me in round. Where, three. Was I really? Not. A- yeah, I like dunked on you in speed round two. We were pretty close in round three, but you were. Before okay, me. all right, good, good. I think I think you were before. Yeah, that me makes round sense. Three. So yeah, my round yeah. three, my round three, I had my buddy Toxic Cat from the Play to Win Discord running his usual Ikratimna. He loves that bad form deck um, on the play with his fucking sick as shit kicks our altars. Uh, myself going second on Obnixilis. I remember when this round started, I was actually going to go first again, which I was like, oh my god, I get to go first twice in a row. Amazing. And then they redid the round, and it put me in second. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll accept this. I'll accept this. Um, and then we had uh, we had a, a really interesting one. We had Toothy and Peer, the uh, the partner pair, going third. And then I had Sisei going fourth. And this was another game that I believe I had like a semi quick Obnix list with just value engines that were just like kind of hanging around. Like I ended up with a Bowmaster and then like immediately I, I had the Bowmaster in my opening hand and that was like a big reason I kept the hand. Um, actually, I don't think I had the quickest Obnix list. I think it might have been like turn three Ob. I really relied. I had Ragavan a lot of times this tournament. I had turn one, like I think I had turn one Ragavan almost like every fucking game I played, which was really nice. But so I think turn one, I was just like land whatever Ragavan and I was able to hold up the Bowmaster, however, I did it with like mana sources. I think. I had like Lotus Petal, whatever. And then I play, I end up playing Bowmaster. Um, 
in the turn cycle, and then I play out Nexus on like turn three, I believe is what it was. And Toxic Cat had a one ring, and so he was really sketchy about the Bowmaster. So I start to like politic the one ring pings a little bit here, and I'm like, look, if like right now he's gonna tap it for two, like the, the toothy was on board and was about to get a counter for him drawing a card for turn, I'm like, would you like to tap your one ring and draw two, and I will kill this toothy? And he's like, okay, that's fine, I guess. And so he, you know, he taps his one ring and kills the toothy, so he can't start getting a bunch of card advantage, which you might say, you have a Bowmaster, wouldn't you want to do it? And I'm like, yes, but I'm fine going a little incremental here and making sure no one gets too explosive because I'm in this like really good grindy developmental spot. And what's really nice about when you have Ob and you have Pingers is you don't need to cast any spells that are worth countering. You're just casting random bullshit and it's working. So the fact that I ended up with like Pingers on board, um, this this just developed over several turn cycles of them trying to do shit. And I ended up finally with like Kaderic Parasite and Wheels and all this stuff in Exile. And then this, this, my, my final storm term in this game, I was able to like really conveniently like shut down some pieces with Bowmasters as well, make sure Sissei couldn't go off and just, just kind of control. And Toxic had a bunch of creatures on board and I kept saying, I was like, you tap your wondering, I'm not hitting shit. <laughs> tap your wondering, I won't hit you shit right now. You know, stuff like that. Uh, because I don't I don't want to put the pings of creatures. I want to put them at face so I get right. cards. Mm -hmm. Because every card they draw is then a card that I draw. People don't realize, like, if you get an Obnixilus and a Mayhem Devil and you have treasures, you've turned Obnixilus into Corbold. If you get Obnixilus with Bowmaster and Kadaric Parasite, you've turned it into Consphinx. Like, you you end up building these incredible value engines in the game out of these bullshit draft draft creatures, which is fun as fuck. Um, and so, yeah, I end up going, I, I like, I, mean, I like, can't remember this game super clearly, but I'm pretty sure I, I asked Toxic. He sent me, he's going to send me the recording tonight, so I just don't, I haven't been able to rewatch it yet. Um, but he said my last turn was just like a, a ridiculous storm turn of just like hitting shit off the top and then eventually getting to a position where like I, I think I was able to like defense grid or something and make sure they couldn't do anything. And then I was able to like play a parasite, play my bowmaster, and like show the wheel of fortune and say we good, essentially, because it was enough damage to to kill the table. Oh yes, that is what happened. I was able to I was able to completely kill Toxic with pings and direct damage, because like all the bowmaster pings and everything I was just pointing at his face at this point. And um and then I was able to kill the other players with the combination of like wheel parasite bowmasters. Like the bowmaster triggers plus the parasite triggers was enough damage to just like kill them once I finally got to that position with like defense greater conquer slayer whatever protection I had. Um so that was a really nice, really nice storm win. Um really happy to get there. And then I mean, we talked after round three, we were both two and one, and we were like, holy shit, we're we're doing it and we were in the play to the uh, colors of a crutch discord talking and we were like we're probably gonna be against each other yeah, we saw it coming. there's a there's a really good yeah, chance we saw it coming. and we, we had a conversation about it and we said like what do we do for against each other at this point you know and both of us really wanted to get top 16 on these decks at this point because it was it was so visible it was so clear that we could accomplish this and so as much as I kind of wanted to, to splodunk on my daddy satellite in the Swiss we did have a conversation about like we would feel pretty bad if one of us knocked the other one out of top 16. Um, so we kind of agreed if we end up in the same pod, we're really just going to like push for an ID here at 10 points because we'll be against all of the 10 pointers. We'll be in a really good spot. And that is what occurred. Um, round four, we did end up paired against each other. We had a conversation with the table. Max was actually on the play. I think I was third seat for this right. one. Um, and and the other player, I might have been fourth seat actually, but the other players were like absolutely down to ID. They had no qualms with it at all. Pretty quick thing there. And I think, like I said earlier, Ashani, Ashani hopped into the chat when we were talking, was like, please play this game. Like, this is exactly what we want for the stream. We would like to talk about this storyline. We would like to see you guys play and have this battle. And yeah, we were both like, like I said before, we called yeah, the shot. We, were, we called the shot again. Yeah. I mean, basically, we both are like, like no, yeah. we're going to play in the top four. <laughs> Obviously, we're, we're going to play the finals. Yeah, we're not going to do this right now. We we will settle this beyond the Swiss. Yeah, um, and that was uh, that was our that was our called shot right there. And then we we had, we I mean that was it. We ID'd round four, and we just kind of like hung out and chilled, got a nice little break, which was super good. Um, and then that heads us into round five, where I think you yeah about, uh, yeah something. round round five is a was a difficult one, and you know I'll, we're going to sort of make a little tangent here. You know the way that the tournaments are structured right now. Um, you know, these online tournaments, despite being 140 people, uh, only have five rounds of Swiss. And if you talk to Mikey, if you talk to Zane, uh, they've done a lot of modeling, a lot of data modeling on the numbers. Not enough it's rounds. It's just not even close to enough rounds. I mean, you really need six, probably seven rounds uh, to have a, a good, solid mathematical formula for determining top 16 in with that many people. Um, and the end result of, of them trying to cram you know, 140 people into five rounds is you end up with these situations where basically getting two wins, a high opponent win percentage, and draws is enough to make top 16. 
Um, and that's exactly where I was at that point in time. Mathematically, we looked at the numbers like 10 times. I'm like, I am guaranteed, almost definitely guaranteed a top 16 spot with a draw going to this next round. Um, why would I want to bypass that? Like, you know, why, why, why would you take the risk of giving that up? So if I had the opportunity to draw next round, I'm absolutely taking it because, you know, why would I play an extra, an extra game that I don't have to, or risk losing my top 16 spot for no reason. Uh, the only benefit could be I could improve my seating position uh, in the top 16 pods, which is cool. Uh, but if you ask me, would I rather play two games, you know, being a semifinal round and a final round in bad seating position, or do I rather play three games uh, in maybe better position? Maybe not. Um, and th to me, the answer is very clear. I want my top 16 locked. That's what I want. But going into the fifth round, the way the pairings worked, and this is the, the big problem, is we had three players, including myself, who were all in that exact same position where we were mathematically locked for top 16 with a draw. And then we had another guy, um, you know, who was in fourth seat, which is like also kind of bad. Um, and he was a win and in situation. So he really needed a win here. We all really wanted a draw. Um, and, you know, you know, I'll be I'll be straightforward and honest. You know, we pushed for the draw right out of the gate. We're like, we don't want to. We we really would like to draw here. We really don't want to have to play this game. Um, and you know, I know that you you need to play it, but but be aware that like you're in fourth seat. Um, we're all going ahead of you, and we all want to draw. So we're very incentivized to keep you from winning. Um, you know, obviously you can't like, you know, there's only so far you can go with that. Like, if you really want to play, we're gonna play. But I think it's a it's ill advised. Um, and he's like, um, well, I'll mull and I'll see where I'm at with my mulligans. You know, if I get a decent hand, you know, then, you know, I want to play. If I can't get a good hand, then, you know, okay, fine, we could draw. But he goes through his mulligans. He ends up mulling down to five. And I'm in first seat. Um, and he decides he wants to keep and play. I mull to a absolutely gas hand. My hand is ad nauseum, land, land, pro mox, mayhem devil, and scheming symmetry. Okay, super gas even more so because scheming symmetry is one of these cards that like if you're trying to win a game that might turn into a 3v1, that's real bad, right? Because scheming symmetry is going to give not just one person a tutor against you, but two, right? So I like before we even get started, I'm like, I, I'm just going to show the table. I have the scheming symmetry. So this is even worse now. Are you sure you, you don't want to draw here? Because I, I don't think you have a chance. I, I do. I do think that I think that was the mistake. And I think that's where you took it too far. Probably. Maybe. I, I, I don't. I don't agree with showing the scheming symmetry and saying it like that because I think that that come, comes across in a very yeah. Way. I agree. Which it's just it's just honestly no, I, I, you know what I mean. Like I, it's a learning experience. Like I think you know you didn't handle the situation perfectly. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, and and like and I'll say this. Like you know I can't imagine you know how terrible it must have felt from his side, right? Because he must have felt completely bullied by this whole situation and just felt terrible. Um, and like I like I felt bad afterwards. I felt terrible, you know, because it. I don't want to put people through that experience. I don't want people to feel like that. That wasn't my intention. Like in my mind, I'm just in strategy mode. I'm trying to figure out how do I get my top 16 secured and, and not lose this game. Right. So like, I don't want to take it. I want to take as little risk as I possibly can. But in any case, like he still wants to play fine. So I take my turn. I cast the Chromox. I cast my, I play my land. I cast the scheming symmetry and I talk to the table. Like, Hey, if I give you the scheming symmetry, what will you get? So on and so forth. The guy in second seat says, I'll use a scheming symmetry and I'll get a Rhystic Study that I can't cast yet. I'm like, cool, that works for me. Cast the scheming symmetry. I went and got a dark ritual, put it on top of my library. Uh, guy in second seat puts a Rhystic Study on top and I pass the turn. He plays, he goes actually, he goes turn one fish and passes, right? Goes back around, nobody does anything. Everyone taps out, comes back to my turn. I draw my dark ritual. I play my dark ritual. I'm at 39 life. I cast Adnaz. No one has anything. At that point, I say, now would you like to draw? Right? Because, you know, and, and it's a difficult situation because, like, I probably just win the game there with 39 life and an Adnaz that's going to resolve, that has resolved. Like, the chances of me losing there are very slim, but there still is a chance. So from my perspective, I still want to take the draw there because I want to lock in. Um, but at that point, the other player, like, clearly upset, you know, just logs off. He says, fine. I agree and logs off and disappears. And we're all sat there sort of quietly for like, uh, you know, 30 seconds of digesting that this had happened and feeling bad about it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the situation there is if the Adnons resolves, it's either you win or the guy with the fish wins. Yeah. 
So he is then locked in a absolute fuck spot. But when when it was the fish player tapped out as well. Oh yeah, yeah, he was tapped out. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if he if he's if he's tapped out, and we do like. There's very few cards that are going to stop you there. Like you're, you're and, and, and one of the cards in his hand is a Rhystic Study. So I already know that, like, you know, he, he doesn't have any interaction. He couldn't stop the Adnaz. Like, I, you know, those yeah. are the games I win. Um, so, but, you know, it still felt terrible. Um, afterwards, um, you know, he did take to Twitter and express his displeasure, which I, like, I completely understand. I get where he's coming from. I can't imagine how bad it must have felt. Um, I did reach out to him, and he and I had a very good conversation. You know, sort of talk through the whole thing um and i think uh you know i think he, he understands where i was coming from uh i understand completely where he was coming from and i do think you know the way that we pressured him and the way that we were so anxious to get to that draw really created a terrible experience for him and that's on me right that's on me it's on me. the other players who are there but I, you know i put it on myself um you know i i was not the person i wanted to be right i pressured him in ways that i don't feel good about um, so, you know, I expressed that to him and I apologized. I told him, you know, I feel bad about it. Um, I don't feel like I made any plays that were wrong. I don't feel like, you know, what I did in terms of getting the draw was wrong, but the way that we, you know, presented it, the way that we talked about it, I think that was not okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you were, you were just too, you were too harsh on the get go. Yeah. It. I mean, if, if I'm in your position there, I say to the person, I say, look, I understand you are at a winning in, you are in fourth seat. Um, this is going to be a hard, difficult situation for you. We are all very interested in the draw. If you feel the need to play, I get that. And we can start the game and we can see where your malls go. If your malls aren't good and you're willing to draw, like if, if all three of you have already said like we want to draw, then I would say like, if your malls aren't good, if you'd be willing to just take the draw and save us time, that'd be great. If you still feel the need to play, I absolutely understand. And we can go to different points of the game and have the conversation when it comes yes. to it. And I think you just do that relax there. And that's where, if you just say that at the start, he understands the situation. He knows it's going to be difficult. You cast the Adnaz and you say, "Now would you like to draw?" And he goes, "Yes." And and that would have been a much a much calmer, nicer way with the same yes. result. Agreed. Agreed. Um, but I mean, that, I I I also got fucking flamed because I responded to his thing on Twitter to kind of like defend you. Where I was like, offering the draw on the Adnaz is actually like a very classy move there, very similar to what Ori did in round seven at, at Top Deck Expo, where it's like, I have the win on the stack. I would just like to go to top sixteen. Let's not fuck anybody here. Let's exactly. Just, you know, and that's exactly break. yeah. So I, I have that's no exactly, qualms. Yeah, that was exactly my the intent, scheming yeah. symmetry. I do not think. The scheming symmetry, especially if you had a conversation about what are people going to get, there's I don't think there's any fucking like weird collusion on that. That seems perfectly reasonable to me. And what, what I've said about this, because a lot of people have asked, there's been a huge conversation about IDs recently, and obviously I'm known for taking a lot of IDs to get into top 16. And what I've said is this. My exact quote is, don't hate the player, hate the game. I'm at the tournament to win, and I will make the best decisions to achieve that goal within the structure I yes. have presented. That is my job as the player. I am not there to farm clout. I am not there for any purpose other than to make the best choices in the structure I am presented that I think will result in me winning that tournament. And locking a top 16 spot is what I want to do because I have a very good track record of winning my top 16 games from third seat. I don't give a shit if I'm third seat or first seat. I do fine, no matter what fucking position I'm in. So I just want to get there so then I can get to top four and try and win this Yeah, and, and again, like I said, I mean, your expected return of trying to win three games of CDH versus trying to win two games of CDH, it's just it's just much better to play two. I'm sorry, that's just the way that that works out. Um, so it's very difficult to ask someone who's been playing Magic for at that point like eight or nine hours at that point, or maybe ten hours. It's more than that, right? It was even more than that at that point. Um, to say, hey, round round five. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, all the rounds. So, really so it's far like, over, okay, here's so. the choice: either a, I play a game that I might lose and kick me out of top sixteen. Or I take a draw, I go get myself a hot meal, I go hang out with my family for an hour and a half, I go take a shower, I take a walk, and I relax. Like, and then my mental state is better going into the top 16. So I will take that and fourth seat over first or second seat in top 16, frazzled, tired, hungry, and exhausted. Like, I'm just, like, every time. I'll take it seven days a week, you know, and twice on Sundays. Dude, it's just not even close to for me um so you know in order to prevent that like if you're going to give players that that decision right you can't you cannot expect realistically that i'm just gonna go oh i'm you know i'm i'm mad i go and play for win you know even though it 
it hurt me. Like, no, I'm not doing that. And it's not reasonable to... I mean, some people do. Uh, some people do. I respect, I, I respect people who have the balls to do that. And frankly, maybe that's... A... Well, it, it also depends on your... It also depends on your deck. Like, Shauna is known for never taking a draw, but, like, Niv-Mizzet is a deck that is seriously helped by being higher in, in Cedar. Sure, sure. Like, being on that type well, of tempo control strategy, like, it, it Well, but matters. so is Florian. Florian loves to go first or second. It makes a huge difference in those early win turns. But but the thing is, it's like... Yeah, but Rakdos is a... We're Dockside decks. Like, Dockside decks get a little bit of slack on the later turn order when well, we try but, to go fast. Yeah, okay. But Niv is also a Dockside deck, too, right? It wants that Dockside. Yeah, yeah, but not in the same yeah. way. It's not it's not Dockside into immediate win. It's Dockside for tempo Yeah, value. but regardless... regardless Regardless of that, the, you know, the, the point is, is that, you know, I have total respect for people who want to take a strategy where they're like, I really want to get a high seat. I want to get a higher seat. I think that for me, getting a higher seat in top 16 gives me a better chance to win the tournament. So I'm willing to take the risk in that fifth round of playing and to try to get a better seat. I respect that. I understand that. But it's not reasonable to expect that everyone's going to make that decision because that's not a strategy that works for me and for a lot of other people, um, you know period end of story um so if you don't want that if we don't want that to keep happening you have to make some changes to the way things work you have to either change the way that pairing gets done where you do something like we've talked about on the channel before where you have at least two people who need to win in a pod right or you just frankly the the you know what mikey has talked about what zane has talked about over and over again you just need to have more rounds right you need to have more rounds in the tournament whether that's having a second day i don't know what that is i don't know how to do that but if you want to solve this problem that's what you have to do. Otherwise, the problem will persist. Period. Um, and you have to you have to be willing to live with that if you're not going to change anything. So, all that all that aside to say, you know, that's the way that 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 game went down. Uh, I put the Adnaz on the stock, stack turn two, offered the draw. It was taken, and that was uh, the final draw. And we moved from there to top sixteen. Well, I have my round. Oh yeah, I well I moved to top sixteen at that point. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my my round five, I uh, I was against a, another ten pointer who was on a win and in and like theoretically had to play if he wanted a top sixteen spot. It was run run its BC, uh, and he was on the play for this for this round five game. I was in second seat. We had Samurai Dancer who was locked with a draw in third seat, and we had Doc Lime who was second seat overall and was already locked for top sixteen in fourth seat. And, you know, I immediately just start the conversation. Is there any comfortability with a draw here? Assuming to hear a no from Run It's BP, but just like, I'll have the conversation. You know what I mean? And his immediate response, I just realized I'm not holding my microphone. Sorry if any of that was worse audio. Um, his immediate response, I just want to say like, what a, what a cool guy. He was immediately like, I am super happy with today. If me taking a draw here means all three of you guys are locked for top 16, I am 100% okay with that and have no qualms with the decision. I'm so down to just go eat some food. That was the that was the person who had a win and ends response, and so I was immediately like, "Great!" He was super down for the draw. I was super down for the draw. Samurai Dance was super down for the draw. The only person who wasn't was Doc Lime in fourth seat as the second seat overall, going into top like right now, and I was like, "Huh?" And he was like, I, I'm already locked. I might as well play for, for seat position. Like, there's no downside for me here. And I was like, well, here's your situation. Um, you're in fourth seat. And if you lose this game, you are at 12 points. And you will probably be the second or third seat position in your top 16 game. If you take the draw here, you are, go up to 13 points. And you will almost deterministically be on the play for your top 16 game. Right. So the upside of you winning the game here versus losing is very, very small. And your only real upside if you win this game would be if another person who was on the play for the top 16 game also got into the final four, then you'd be ahead of them. So that doesn't really seem worth it to me. And then Doc Lime switched it to his role to like really hard trying to convince the guy at 10 points that he should play this game and there's no way he should take the draw here because it's his winning end. And the guy was just like, I, I know, I'm down to draw, I don't care. <laughs> so it was it was kind of comical to have the person who really needed to play be so down for the draw and the person who needed to play the least not want to take the draw. Um, but after a couple minutes of conversation, he was like, okay, fine, we can draw. So that one was, was pretty quick. Um, and yeah, I also got to take the draw there and we both were... We're locked for top 16, baby. And you spent this entire like hour and a half before top 16 stressing the fuck out, thinking somehow you weren't going to make it at 12 points with your opponent win percentage. And I was like, shut the fuck up. so dumb. It's so dumb because we had already done the math. We'd sat there and looked through everything and like looked at like every possible outcome. 
and there was just no way like i was oh, i was going God. to top 16 at that point it was locked in it was just it was a done deal i was so annoyed by your fucking constant <laughs> but stress i get like that like, i'm oh, afraid chill. that like if i get too confident and then then it'll come back and, and bite me but yeah no we definitely we both made top 16 i ended up at what was that 15th going out of the swiss like or 14th you were 15th and i was uh 10th, i think i was 11th uh, I was, I think it was eleven, something like that. Oh no, I was, I was, I was twelve. I was twelve. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. were twelve and I was fifteen. Because, yeah. for, it, because it goes, it, I was, I was in the pod that was fourth seed, five seed, twelve, thirteen. Yeah, and you were in the pod that had two. You were again in the pod that had two, seven, ten. 15. Right. So our, so our, our duel to determine who is the best deck, you know, Florian or Obnixilis, At that point, we had exactly the same record. We won all the same rounds. <laughs> Like in very similar ways the whole way through, and the only difference was you know your opponents won more games than my opponents won, um, but you were yeah, which means I had a harder path to victory. Uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, yeah. yeah, very exciting at that point. I'm jumping up and down. You're jumping up and down. We're like on the on the Colors of Crutch Discord channel, just like you know jumping up and down in the channel, you know celebrating, being happy, and excited for the next round. You know, and and you know, as soon as the pairings came up, we saw we weren't against each other. Even more excited because, you know, the, the dream yeah. became real, like a real possibility at that point. Um, I did go into the next mm -hmm. round though in fourth seat, which was, you know, I'm like, you know, whatever. I already won a game this tournament on fourth seat. Let's just just do it again, right? Yeah. So, in a, in quite the blue pod. Yeah. Again, another another completely blue <laughs> pod. You know, in first seat I had. I was going against Juggernaut, who had was on Blue Farm. Let me pull it up here real quick. And then in second seat, we had uh, Tevesh Krom. Um, that was um, Beeson, who um, yeah, Beeson. And then in third seat, we had uh, Splocketeer, who was on uh, Najila, right? And then me in fourth seat. Um, and game, you know. Like pretty pretty straightforward game in the in the early going. I you know I managed to land uh, a Florian um, pretty early, um, and I was just you know doing my thing, attacking, swinging out, you know getting some value, put some artifacts on the battlefield, making my land drops. Nothing insane, um, but what I was doing was holding in my hand a, a deflecting SWAT that I was sandbagging the crap out of, uh, and a Underworld Breach, and I was just holding them in my hand trying to build up enough protection so that I would be able to go for my win. And I was just like, I'm just gonna be patient here. I'm gonna, not gonna be the first one to go for it. I'm gonna get you know pieces in place. And when the window opportunity presents itself, then I will seize it and go for it. So um, I was doing Florian things, getting swings in. Nothing crazy, I was just swinging for, just with Florian for the most part, you know, for three damage each time. Um, ended up hitting a, uh, a Burgee, putting a Burgee into play. I hit a, a Goblin Engineer at one point. Played the Goblin Engineer with the hope of uh, getting a defense grid or a Conqueror Slayer to put it in my graveyard so that I could uh, set up protection to go for a win in a future turn. Um, and um, <laughs> you're getting your dog. Look at that. Um, but I played the, I play the, uh, the, the Goblin Engineer, and um, my opponent immediately responds. Uh, Najila responds with a Opposition Agent. Um, you know, fortunately, Goblin Engineer is a May trigger and not a must trigger. So I respond over top of the opposition agent with a vamp tutor. Uh, and with the vamp tutor, I go and I get the defense grid that I was planning to get with the goblin engineer anyway. So I put the defense grid on top of my library and I choose not to search with the engineer and I pass the turn. Uh, turn goes around, uh, the Gila turn uh, comes up. And once again, like I'm really careful about not being the first one to go for it. Uh, Najila decided this was their time. Uh, so on the second player's turn, this is the Tevish Krom player's turn, uh, they go for, they cast a um, grinding station. Tap out, they have one mana, float, one mana left, they have one land left untapped. They play the grinding station. And in response to the grinding station, the Najila player who has the opposition agent casts an enlightened tutor and puts Underworld Breach on top of their library. At this point, it's, you know, everyone's like scratching their head because, okay, he put, you know, there's a grinding station in play. The grinding station can clearly, you know, execute the tap to put the uh, um, the underworld breach and two other cards into the Najila player's graveyard and disrupt their plan. So we're all like, well, he must have, you know, must have known that was going to happen. He knew that that was the plan. Um, so he's obviously got something else. So the debate around the table, 
Yeah, or or he just misplayed. You know, who knows? Um, but in any case, he's like, uh, you know, the whole table's discussing it, and I'm like, you guys, um, you got to use that grinding station right now. You have to put that in the graveyard because even if he has the play, which is probably Savin's reclamation, um, that's still two more spells that have to be cast into your Ristic study. So for God's sakes, you know, give up your grinding station. So he does. He taps his grinding station, grinds his own grinding station, put the breach in the graveyard. Pass turn. Goes to Najila's turn. Najila starts the turn. Um, oh, I, you know, I missed some important details here that are very important. In first seat, Blue Farm at this point has a Grand Abolisher in play, right? And is looking extremely dangerous at this point. They had, they had, they had like six I, treasures. I watched the, we watched your game earlier. Today. Yeah, they had like six treasures. They had Grand Abolisher, Dockside, Timna. They had like five cards in hand. They were, they were in a terrifying. They looked like they were about to win the game, right? So Najila goes and uh, on their turn, you know, at this point, breaches in the graveyard. They play, um, I forget what he played, some mana rock. They just went, they just, no, 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 no. They're, they're first cast. They played Lion's Eye Diamond. Silent. He played Lion's Eye Diamond first. Oh, did he play? No, no, no. LED got milled into the graveyard. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Right. Yeah. He just went right to. It, it, he milled, he milled breach, LED, some random card, and then he starts his he turn. Casts, which I will point out yeah. one thing. He, he starts his turn, he set, loses the fish, he lets the fish sack, and then he untaps, draws, and casts Silence. And I was very surprised. I, I, I kind of doubt he drew the Silence for turn. If he did, great draw, you know what I mean? But like, if that's what you're going to do, you cast that Silence with your fish trigger on the stack because there's going to be interaction used on it and you know that, so you want to draw more cards. So I was, I was very surprised that he let the fish go, untapped, drew, or like, let the fish go, drew, and then cast the Silence. Right, right. But in any case, you know, he cast the Silence, you know, the table discusses. Turns out that uh, both player one and player two had force of negations in hand that they were both sandbagging, uh, which is kind of which is kind of hilarious. Uh, so in response, player one casts their own silence, um, and you know, uh, priority passes around. Uh, the Gila player realizes he's not going to be able to get there this turn, um, and he passes on the silences. The the blue farm player silence as well. Uh, at which point I cast the Tainted Pact. And, and then with the Tainted Pact, my goal at this point is uh, just to look for something that is a, sort of a must answer. Like I want to find something that uh, the table is going to get warped around trying to figure out what to do um, and uh, try to figure out a way to stop me, you know, uh, stop the wheel. Uh, because I, in my hand, I had, like I said, I had Underworld Breach. Um, and, you know, my plan is to win on, on that turn coming up. Um, so... Um, Sure enough, I go through the deck, I reveal a whole bunch of useless stuff that doesn't matter, and finally I get to a Wheel of Fortune. And I say, huh, out loud, Wheel of Fortune, and just pause for a second. And the whole table immediately erupts in the conversation, and it's very clear to me that they don't want this wheel. Um, you know, And they're very concerned about the wheel, not even so much because of me, but because they're worried about um, what Blue Farm's gonna do with their Grand Abolisher and uh, you know, a big old pile of mana and, and so on. So I'm like, yeah, that seems good. Seems like it's warping enough. I'll take the wheel. I take the wheel and I go on to my turn. Um, untap, draw for turn. Um, in my hand, I have now, I have my defense grid, which is ready to go. I've got that wheel of fortune. I've got underworld breach and I've got a deflecting swat as well as a, I got another couple of, you know, irrelevant cards, I think at that point, I don't remember. Um, but uh, I immediately, uh, I play a lion's eye diamond, right? Cause I had a lion's eye diamond and I move to combat and I swing uh, Florian over at uh, the devish crom player who at this point, all they have in play is a Burgi. Um, there's a quick discussion about whether to block with the Burgi, and I remind the player that uh, good old Florian has first strike. Um, so no, that would not be a trade. Your, your Burgi would die and my Florian would live. At which point he disgruntled sort of, you know, okay, fine, I'll take three. He takes three, I look at the top three cards, and one of those three cards is Praetor's Grasp. And I'm like, all right, jackpot, here we go. Uh, so I put, the, I put the Praetor's Grasp in exile and um, tap my Mana Vault and cast a defense grid. And then pass priority on my own defense grid. And at that point, all, the whole table erupts and they're trying to figure out like, okay, what's his plan? What's he going to do here? Obviously, we have to answer the defense grid. Um, you know, um, you know what, what are we going to do? And remember, you know, a, a, a previous turn, I had cast that Goblin Engineer with the intention of getting that defense grid the first time uh, before the opposition landed. So I have an engineer that's sitting there just waiting, right? So... 
uh, I, the table discusses, they try to figure out what they're gonna do. Um, and finally they settle on casting a mystical tutor into the opposition agent. I, I, I do want to mention, you also said during this conversation, people were like, well, if he's casting Defense Grid, he's probably trying to win. And you said, you didn't like say like, oh, I got it. You were just like, I don't think I get another turn. So I feel like I got to shoot. <laughs> yeah. I, well, what I said was, you know, cause, because <laughs> showing showing the Wheel of Fortune, they all assumed you were just Defense Grid wheeling and praying. Right. That's what I said is I said, I said, well, I got to, you know, all I could do at this point is I think I have to cast this wheel and see where it goes. Right, that's, I think that's what I said, and so reinforced the idea that that's that was my game plan. Um, so everyone's responding to this defense grid. Finally, they settle on the interaction they're going to use, not the the force of negs that they're, you know, sandbagging in their hand, right, mind you, but <laughs> instead uh, the uh, Tevish Crom player, who's clearly protecting, I guess, what must have been a win in his hand, uh, cast a mystical tutor into the opposition agent that Najila has. And in order for the Najila player to get a counter spell out of his deck to use to stop my defense grid. And I'm like, okay. So at that point, they begin discussing what counter spell to get. Um, and it becomes apparent that Force of Neg is in his hand because the Najila player asks, well, can you give me a Force of Neg? And he's like, well, you know that I can't do that. Well, because he just looked at his hand and he knows that it's in his hand. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so um, he's like, well, what else can I get? And I'm like, well, your option. Uh, so I start leading the conversation at this point. I'm like, well, your options are you can either get like a force of will and hard cast it because you have the mana for it. Or you can get, you know, a mana drain. Mana drain would work. Like, why don't you get a mana drain? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Mana drain seems to, yeah, that'll work. So he goes and he gets them in. Which I, I do, I want to point out when, when he's doing this, he has four mana available. Which means that if he were to cast a mana drain and the defense grid were to somehow find its way back to the battlefield, he would only have two mana. Which is not enough to do anything else <laughs> with a defense grid in For play. A defense grid. Right. So he goes and he actually had, it's even worse than that because he had five mana. He actually had five mana at that point and he cast. Oh, he paid for Ristic. He paid yes. for Ristic. So he cast, oh he cast yeah. the mana drain, but, but he had just seen uh, Tevish Krom's hand. So he knew that if it got back to Tevish Krom, Tevish Krom was going to win the game. So the last thing he wanted to do was give him another card. So he cast the mana drain, yeah. pays for Ristic. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you got me. Guys, you got me. Defense Grid is countered. Goes to the graveyard. I immediately activate Goblin Engineer and put Defense Grid right back into play. At that point, the table knew that there was a problem <laughs> because now uh, the only person who could interact anymore was now uh, Timnacrom in first seat. And they still had six treasures, right? They were still sitting in a pretty good spot to, to deal with whatever I was going to do, or at least what they knew I had, right? So at that point, I go and I cast the Praetor's Grasp. And at this point, this is a win-win for me because if the Praetor's Grasp resolves, I go and get some kind of counter spell from their deck whether that be a pact or, you know, whatever it is, I go get a, get some interaction from his deck and then he can't interact with me further because I have protection. If it doesn't resolve, he's used his interaction to stop me from my Praetor's Grasp and I'm good to go. So sure enough, he fires off that force of negation that he's been hiding in his hand the whole time, targeting the uh, Praetor's Grasp that I don't even need at this point, by the way. Um, so, okay, all right, cool. Um, I'll respond to that. And I use the defense grid that's in, I mean, the uh, deflecting swat that's in my hand. And I hear the other player go, oh shit. <laughs> Cause they realize that the, the, the trouble has gotten deeper at this point. So he's well, all right. Well, I still have one other piece of interaction. And in order to cast a fierce guardianship, he had to sacrifice three of his six treasures. Force of negation. Right, force of negation. In order to cast that force of negation, he had to sacrifice three of his six treasures. Right, and then in order to cast a deflecting swat, he had to he had to sacrifice his last three treasures. So now he has no more treasures. Um, I'm like, cool, yeah, you got me again. Deflecting swat, it, it resolves. My uh, Praetor's Grasp goes to exile. But yeah, so he casts that deflecting swat, and I'm like, yeah, you got me. Um, yeah, you 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 win. You you will counter my uh, Praetor's Grasp. My Praetor's Grasp goes to exile. Okay, now I cast my Underworld Breach. And at that point, the whole table just deflated. You could see that it was, you know, at this point it's basically over because I have a deflecting swat in my graveyard. Um, two of the players, you know, um, Blue Farm has no mana available and there's a defense grid in play. Uh, Tevish Krom has no mana untapped and there's a defense grid in play. Player three has two mana available. So theoretically they could get a Boseju, um, you know, somehow. 
Um, but I have Deflect Spot in my yard and plenty of mana to do to, to cast it with because this entire time I'm casting these spells, I'm getting Burgy triggers and generating red mana. So I'm good to go. So I cast the Underworld Breach. Um, everyone groans. I cast the Wheel of Fortune. I draw my seven cards. One of my seven cards is a grinding station. I cast the grinding station. I explain the loop of, of sacrificing my mana uh, crypt, you know, putting three cards in my yard, recasting the mana crypt, generating mana, repeat, 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 explain to them I'm going to get Aetherflux Reservoir and the table scoops it up. And I have... Which they shouldn't have. They, they should have made you play until you got the Aetherflux. Correct, and give away a little secret here when it comes to Florian. Um, you know, I still have to get Aetherflux to win the game, and there's an opposition agent in play. So that means that I have to grind and hopefully hit the Aetherflux Reservoir before I've gone through too much of my library to win. Um, or any or a any, removal any spell, and then removal yeah. spell, or any removal. Which like you already had tutors and yards, so like the the odds that that whiffs there are almost zero. But theoretically, there is some tiny world where the last five cards in your library are removal spells at Aether. Correct. And 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 you get dumped. Correct. On and that it's so unlikely, it's so irrelevant. But like technically, correct. They should have and and a top sixteen game make me play it, <laughs> honestly. But you know, hey, I just advanced to my first top four. On Florian, the deck that everyone thought wasn't even the CDH deck. So, boom. I felt so good. I literally screamed out loud in the middle of the night, woke up my kids. Like, like it was fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and now all I had to do was hope that my brother in Rakdos was also going to get there. Uh, so then we go into into my top 16 game. My top 16 game, which I, look, I just looked at the entire top 16. The only non-blue decks were you and me, Magda, who was in my top 16 pod, and a Dihada player who was on the play for their top 16. My game was, um, it was Eureka on the play. It was Magda going second, myself going third, and we had Tevish Krom going fourth. Tevish Krom had, had a few top 16s. Good tournament for Tevish Krom again. They've kind of been, been lacking a little bit there. We'll get to that when we talk about the meta. But I end up keeping, I believe, a six card hand. That is once again a Ragavan hand. <laughs> I just saw Ragavan like every fucking game. I had land, Mox Diamond, Ragavan, Disciple the Ball for my turn one. And then my turn two was just desperate ritual into uh, into Ob if I didn't have another land, which I didn't I didn't draw another land for, for several turns in this game. And uh, Eureka does like a normal, you know, whatever into Eureka kind of start. Um, Magda ends up just going like, you know, spark whatever in Magda. Like they have their, their normal start that like immediately looks like it's going to get out of hand quickly with Magda and just the way it works, but you never know what's in their hand. Um, and then I play, I try and cast up Nixilis on, on my second turn. And there was immediately a conversation at the table because Eureka wants to force a will it. And I try and politic really hard on this one. You, you watched it with me. I was like, bruh, like force a will is such a premium piece of interaction in this pod. You do not want to blow your interaction right here. Magda's already ahead. Like, Tevish Krom already has a Grim Monolith or whatever. Like, I, I don't even remember. They didn't look too terrifying. Maybe I think they had the Grim Monolith already. I'm like, like, if you hit my ob here, congratulations. You're taking me out of this game, but you're using your best piece of interaction, and you're not, you're, you're hurting the player who's currently in the worst position. I have the least cards in hand. I have the most man, I have the least man on board. Like, I don't think it's correct to use this force here. And he's like, I don't have anything for Magda, so I might as well use this here. And I'm like, my deck has the most for Magda. Like all of these random pings I get, my deck plays an absolute dick load of removal, an insane amount of removal because we lose to Drannith. Yeah. So I have so many pieces of removal that just dunk on Magda and a lot of them are free. And so I'm like, like you're worried about Magda, you don't have anything for Magda, I'm the way out to Magda. Um, and that was kind of my well, argument. Well, can I, say, can I say? Didn't. didn't yeah, work. well, can I say like the, yeah. it did work, even though it didn't work, even though uh, in the end, the force of will still got fired and you still lost your, your ob, at least in, at that point. What you did at that point was brilliant because what you did was set the stage for the entire game that Magda was the threat, that Magda was the problem and that everyone needed to address Magda. And that theme continued through the whole game because of that initial politic, right? And even though it didn't work, it did. even it though it didn't did. save your ob, it, I think it won you the game, dude. So anyway, go on. It go might on. have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it might have. It definitely, uh, it definitely put me in a position where I could play possum, like play possum really, really well. And uh, which I was in the worst position by a mile after losing my off. My hand at that point was like Prosper, Mayhem, Devil. Um, I don't even remember. I had, I had one other card, but it was like Prosper, Mayhem, Devil and some useless card. Like my hand literally did nothing. I was really reliant on the like Ragamade Disciple of all plan. And the, the, the reason they countered the ob as well was they had a city bass on the battlefield. Tavish Karma and a mana was on the battlefield. Their next land, hand, land they had in hand was a Cephalid Coliseum. You know, Tavish Karma was saying their next land pinged as well. Like, 
they were really worried about giving me a lot of ob sugars, which like totally, totally fair. Like I get it, you know, I, I had to try and get my ob to stick there. And I do think there's a very real argument that like, if you're concerned about Magda, I'm the answer to Magda. But like, of course, shutting me down is not the worst thing to be doing. And, and I, you know, I brought it up during the game as well. I was like, it's not a play that has no value. I was just surprised you did. Um, and so we, we go around for a few turn cycles here. And like, you know, I even cast a Mayhem Devil, which is something that could ping Magda. And there ends up being like one ping from something to crack. And immediately the Rico player is like, oh, please kill Magda. And and I immediately say, bruh, I am uh, I'm out of this game as it currently stands. Um, my best chance to get into this game is for it to take as long as possible. Um, that's your job, not mine. I need you to use your resource on other players if I have a way to get back into this game. So I'm going to ping and there was immediately some eyebrow raises you could tell from me not hitting the magda and i stand by that play I, that is that is not my fucking problem at that point you know i wasn't worried about magda winning right winning right away yuriko plays a ton of removal they'd already revealed like a crippling fear and i was just like i am not gonna solve your problems for you i need to sit back and chill and let you guys deal with each other and hope that i can find a way back into this game and so i i don't do that i play the mayhem devil go another turn cycle here magda gets to a point that they have five treasures and they don't activate on my following turn i um i hit with ragaman at yuriko and i hit an imperial seal and immediately i'm like "Ooh, i'm thinking about casting this and i'm like tevkrom you're not gonna hopple me right he's like absolutely not and yuriko's like i'm not hoppling you don't worry and i was like okay then i will i will cast this imperial seal and at this point i have three lands i was able to finally top deck a land so i i, I, I had two lands mox diamond and a ragaman treasure so I tap the land for the Imperial Seal, and the options I'm looking at, I looked at it, I was like, okay, I get Mana Crypt, and that gets me back to Aub. I could get Adnaz here and try and snipe something, but it's difficult when, like, Yuriko tutored at one point in this game, they Demonic tutored, and when they tutored, they were revealing the cards enough that I, I knew they grabbed a Fierce. It was, like, very held up to the camera, which is, okay, not my fault. If you're going to show me, then I fucking know it's there. So I knew he had a Fierce, and he had revealed the Flusterstormer from your trigger. So I was kind of like, Adnaz is not the play right now, my guy. <laughs> and uh, I end up deciding on Dockside where I'm like, this will get me to AWP at a worst case. And if Magda for some reason doesn't crack their treasures because they don't want to do that yet, then I get a lot. Um, and I have the Mayhem Devil and I have a Disciple of the Vault. Like Dockside seems like the safer play here. Before I got back to my next turn, on the on the like end step before their turn, uh, Magda cracks their five treasures. I use my Mayhem Devil triggers to kill Magda, the Spark, Dwarf, and Eureka. Five Disciple of the Vault triggers I point at Eureka because Eureka, their first Eureka attract dunked on us for 11 mm. with whatever the fuck they flipped off the top. So I was like, okay, let's make sure. So my, my plan during this game is I was like, I need Eureka to use their resource to deal with the other people. And I'm going to keep hitting Eureka's life total so they don't get too far ahead. And so also that puts me in a really good position. When you're playing on Nixilis and you go in these storm turns, there is a lot of value in making sure that one person does not have significantly more life than everyone else, because you end up going on these natural storm pinging turns with, with just pingers, where you want to kill everyone at nearly the same time. So if there's one person that's just left at 40 life, it sometimes can be difficult to kill that person. So in my brain, I'm like, I want to keep Eureka down at our level as well. So I'm hitting them with all the triggers. Magda ends up getting a portal to Phyrexia, which blows up my whole board of Ragavan Disciple Mayhem Devil, blows up Tevis Krom's board of their two Thrall tokens in Krom, gives me more Mayhem Devil triggers because that's a sacrifice. So <laughs> I point one more damage at Tevis just to keep it at a certain number, and I point the other five back at Eureka. Magda reanimates their Spark Double, goes back to my turn. Um, I untap, I play Dockside, I make four treasures of it, I have two more remaining mana, I cast off Nixilis, I pass the turn tapped out. And I immediately start politicking the ob pings because again, I've got like three cards in hand. My hand's not doing shit. And uh, I end up getting a ping pretty early in the turn cycle from someone and it gives me a deadly relic, which can hit Magda, um, which Magda has already replayed Magda. They had a jewel Lotus in hand, whatever. And Magda, by the way, early on, they swung with my Ragavan when they stole it with I claim the first one, I believe. And they hit Eureka, and they hit a Mystical Tutor, so they put Fork on top. So I knew they had a Fork, and I cannot lose my AWP here. So there's no world I'm casting this Deadly Relic if they have two red held up. So we end up going to, like, the turn... Uh, we end up going to the end step before Magda's turn, and they tap out to channel Twin Shot Sniper targeting my Dockside. And immediately, Eureka's like, oh, just Deadly Relic your Dockside. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I am not your police. I will be doing what is best for me in this game. And I say, I would like to Deadly Relic the Magda, but I also don't want to make it too easy on him. I think a Deflecting Swat is the best choice here. You have a Deflecting Swat, Tevish Krom. He goes, no. I say, okay, 
I play Deflecting Swat. It is free. Would you like to give me some odd pings, Eureka? And Eureka gets convinced to give me two triggers on Obnixilis where I hit Necropotence and Arcane Signet. And then I go, okay, Deadly Relic Magda, he's tapped out. So, which is like what I probably would have done anyway, but I was glad that I was able to get two extra cards out of that, out of that all political transaction. You're a monster. You're a um, monster. So I dead, <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> I, uh, I, I Deadly Relic the, the Magda and he's like, fuck, okay, that hurts. And he, so then he untaps, he reanimates the Dockside as he originally planned to. He gets um, like six treasures out of it, which he ends up having to just tap four lands, crack two treasures, or uh, maybe he got four treasures, somewhat, maybe it was four or five. He might've got, Four. But he got just four, four treasures, treasures out of yeah. it, actually. Yeah, it was four. So he so he so he taps his four lands, cracks two treasures, cast Magda, only has two treasures, ends up um swinging with the spark mage at, at Tevishkram or yeah, something like that, and then is able to to make get up to three treasures. Uh and then passes the turn. How did he get the reanimate? How did he get the reanimate? Did that come? Portal to Phyrexia. Ah, there you go. Okay. So he's he's reanimating stuff every yeah. turn. So he reanimated the spark, the spark one, the first one, and then reanimated my dockside on this one. And that's why he was twin shots sniping on that yeah. stuff. So he could reanimate the dockside and immediately start figuring again. But I was like, cool, you tapped out. Here's a deadly roll. Right. Um, but so I go to my next turn. I untap. I don't draw shit. That matters. <laughs> something else irrelevant. And I'm like, okay. Uh, well, actually, I think I, I drew I drew arid mesa or something like some land. So I was like, okay, here's an arid mesa. Crack it. I'm gonna get this basic mountain. And I think I'm like, I think I'm casting this Necro and immediately Eureka, which by the way, Eureka on the previous turn had shown a Phantasmal image and was considering it. And I was like, if you get Ob, I already had the Deadly Rollick revealed. I was like, if you cast that and you make a copy of Ob, I'm immediately Rollick in it. Like 100% it is Rollick immediately. And he was like, well, I could get Dachshund. I was like, you don't need mana right now. You have like seven mana held up. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, just just hold it. So we had the, the Fimage in hand that I knew about. He had a Fluster in hand that I knew about and he had a Fierce in hand that I knew about. So I, you know, start talking about this Necro and he's like, oh, if you cast Necro, I'm, I'm countering it. And I said, bro, I'm out of this game. Like, if you want to continue to counter all my bullshit when you know you're losing to the other players at the table with what they have, feel free, my guy. I'm going to cast this Necro and if it resolves, I'm going to put five life into it. I'm at 25, now 24 from the fetch land. I was like, I'm going to put five life into this and then I'm going to pass the turn. If you decide you want to counter that, that is on you. I don't care. I'm casting the Necro. And I mentioned during the uh, shuffling of my land, I said, oh, and you have a Phantasmal image. Like, if you copied my op, then I can't use Necro anyway. And he was like, oh, I guess that's true. Then I guess it's probably Can, can I point right. something out, though? No, I, I, I just want to point out some language here. Like, I think it's really important. Yeah. Because you did not say, I'm going to activate Necro and put five cards in my hand. You did not say, I'm going to use Necro to get five cards. You did not say anything about cards. You said, I'm going to put five life into Necro, right? which is a completely different way of looking at it. And it completely throws people off the scent, right? Because they're not thinking about you drawing five cards, which is what you're really doing. You're like, I'm just, I'm going to pay five life. And it just completely downplays what's about to happen. And, and it's really kind of very nuanced sweetness right there that I, I really liked. I really enjoyed watching that part of it. So anyway, glad, glad anyway go, on, go on, go on, go uh, on. But so, yeah, but so I, so the second, the second that I'm like, yeah, you have a image, you copy all, I can't use Necro. And he's like, oh, then I guess that's probably okay. And I'm like, sick, I'm good. So I put the land into play, tap two, player can't signate, tap three, cast Necro. And the dude snap passed on it. And I was like, sick. And I ended up, uh, I did my Necro triggers one at a time. I prefer to do it that way just because sometimes people try and do weird brain freezy bullshit. So I just do them one at a time rather than put them all in the stack. So I did exactly what I said I do. I put five life into Necro. I put five exile triggers. I put five cards into my hand at end step. Within those five cards was Underworld Breach, Grinding Station, Grape Shot, Chrome Mox, and Gamble. Ooh, boy. And I'm like, go! <laughs> I'm like, please, for the love of God, cast that Fierce at some point in the turn cycle. Please cast that Fierce Guardianship at some point in the turn cycle, and I'm good. Um, and on the, on the end step, uh, Tevish Crumb flashes in an opposition agent, and I'm like, sick. Like, that is so good, because people are so worried about me tutoring once I've drawn cards, usually. It stops Magda, so it gives me something I don't have to worry about with Magda. It lets me throw the scent off of myself, and I didn't care about the gamble in hand at all, because I had Necro and I didn't want to discard my Breach or something randomly. So I was like, this opposition agent is the fucking dream for him to put down right now. I discard a fetch land, and I'm like, sick, pass the turn. Like I said, five cards, pass turn. Um, I end up getting two more pings from Tevish Krom. They go down to three life when they cast Krom for seven mana. And I get, uh, I get a Scalding Tarn, I get a Fiber and Archer, a Pinger, a Pinger. I love my Pingers. And uh, Eureka goes to their turn and they end up triggering Krom enough where on the Krom trigger in the stack, he flashes in Orcish Bowmaster. 
Magda has to respond to this because it's going to kill their Magda yet again, and they can't keep having their Magda die. So he cracks two treasures and he casts a Bolt's Trickery. Rico responds by using the Fierce Guardianship that I knew he demonic tutored for all those turns ago. And the second he cast that Fierce, I knew I was winning this game. I was like, let's go. <laughs> Let's go, because baby. Magda was the threat. So we, cast- we saw Magda as the threat. Can't let Magda do anything. <laughs> Magda was the Gotta threat. Gotta stop that dangerous yeah, Magda, and, uh, right? So, so you know, he fierces the Tabalts. It resolves. The Bowmaster lands. It kills Magda. I'm like, let's go, dude. This is this is the dream. Uh, we end up going to Magda's turn. They reanimate Mayhem Devil, and then they start pinging off Eureka's shit. I'm like, sick. <laughs> like, and then, uh, you know, and, and really important, a, a few turns earlier in this game, Eureka tried to play a Null Rod. And the second they revealed the Null Rod, you know, I, I had an Omnixilus for, for at this point that had had pings and was starting to get big. And everyone's life totals were getting really low. Like everyone was below 20. You know, Tevis Krom was at like below 10 for most of this game. And then I had like Magda and Eureka both around 20 life. And, you know, the second he shows the Null Rod, I'm like, Currently, I have no plans to swing Ob at you. If you cast no Rod, I am 100% swinging Ob at you. It's we're dead because I need to have. And I said I didn't say like, oh, I can't win the game with that. I said I need to have a reasonable path to victory. Like I'm in a top six team match, I need to have a reasonable back. So right. right now, I have no intention of swinging Ob at you. If you cast that card, I am swinging Ob at you until you're dead, because it doesn't stop Magda at all. Magda just sacks the treasures. It doesn't need to use the ability of the treasures, and so he doesn't cast the no Rod. And so then on Magda's last turn here, they end up with five lands and a treasure. And they try to cast a God Pharaoh statue, which completely fucks my ability to win the game. And, and he asked earlier in this turn when we were already talking, because he cracked the treasure for the Mayhem Devil trigger before he even showed the God Pharaohs. And so we're having a conversation with Yuriko and hitting their Hope of Gear Purr and all this kind of stuff. And he asked me, he goes, are you swinging at me with Ob? And I was like, I have no intention of swinging at Ob right now. That is absolutely not what I'm intending to do at this time. And then the second he shows the God Pharaoh statue, I go, that's cool. Um, it means I will be swinging Ob at you until you're dead. And Ob is 12 power at this point, and he's at 20 life. And it would give him one turn. Like, if he played a God for a statue and I swing with Ob, it gives him one turn. And he doesn't have Magda on board. Magda costs 8. He doesn't have 8 mana. He has no pathway to victory in that turn. So me saying, I'm swinging Ob at you until you're dead, means you are dead unless someone else bounces the Ob for you, because he didn't have an answer to it. So he thinks about it for a second, and really conveniently, even Eureka goes... If you play that, it shuts off my interaction. You know, which I was like, sick. <laughs> so he ends up changing which, which is, back. He doesn't cast the god. Which, by the way, it's yeah, true. It's true, it's but it's true. also the wrong way to look at it because it, yes, it shuts off your interaction, but at that point, you don't need your interaction. Yeah, I can't win through God Pharaoh's very. Well, I, honestly, if God Pharaoh's is on the battlefield, I killed him with Ob if they do not have. You have to, yeah. Man, which none of them had. None of them had creature yeah. removal. So I, I do, like, if the God Pharaoh's land, I genuinely do believe I win that game. Because it just takes you like three. I turns. just killed him. I, <laughs> I killed him so. I killed him so yeah. quickly. Yeah, I killed him really, really quickly. Uh, with with Ob Nexilus damage there, especially with like how many pings I was able to get. Like Ob, Ob, even with the mana I had that turn and just like casting spells for being more expensive, I still would have been able to make Ob like 15, 16 power that turn, and like that that puts him down to like three, four life yeah. each. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I don't even have to worry about the God Pharaohs. Also, God Pharaohs pings for one, which makes Ob's bigger. Yeah. So he was concerned, Eureka, because he, I was like, I was like, this means I swing off at you. Eureka said, this means I can't use my interaction. And he was worried about the Obnixilus triggers from the God Ferris end step trigger. And so yeah, real bad, like, real bad. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, great. I, and I said to him, I said, I have not passed priority on it. No one has passed priority on it. If you would like to take it back, you can take it back. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to take that back. No problem. Sounds, sounds great, my guy. And he passes the turn to me. <laughs> and I'm like, let's go. In exile at this point, I have, um, I, I got four cards in exile. I got Scalding Tarn, Firebrand Archer, um, Imperial Seal, and Twin Flame. Which I don't really care about the Twin Flame. I don't really care about the Imp Seal because there was an Oppo on board at this time. But I was like, okay, let's uh, let's see what we could cook. <laughs> and so I. Oh, what did you have in your hand? And so I, you had something special in your hand, didn't you? But I had Underworld Breach and Grinding Station, my guy. Yeah. So, and, and Grape and Shot. Grape and shot. Grape Shot. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Grape Shot, which is really big, which is why. So, I end up, first thing I do, play Scalding Tarn, crack the Scalding Tarn, trigger Mayhem Devil from Magnus Board, because he reanimated it, kills the Bowmaster. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> and then I go, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna cast a Firebrand Archer. And immediately, Tempest Krom is shaking in his boots. He's like, oh, I'm so dead, aren't I? And I'm like, yeah, sorry, my guy. Uh, and then I, I, I cast Chromebox for hand, I get a Firebrand Archer trigger, gets me an LED. Sick. 
So I so I cast the LED, gets the fire burnout to trigger, kills Tevish Krom, means there is no longer an opposition agent on the battlefield. And there has not been a spell that he needs to counter yet. The Lion's Eye Diamond reveals a Jessica's will into my exile from the Firebrand Archer trigger. And I immediately ask him, because I know he has a fluster. I say, are you going to fluster a Jessica's will? And he goes, yeah, I think I would have to fluster a Jessica's will. And I go, okay. And I say, well, I need pings. I'm going to tap two. I'm going to cast this onto a breach, which doesn't get got by fluster. I didn't know if he had a counter for it in hand. But using the fierce there in my brain, I was like, if he has a counter, he has to use a mana on it anyway. And then I start going with Jessica's will and the grape shot and I'm probably fine regardless. But I cast the underworld breach and he's immediately like, what is in your graveyard? And I'm like, my graveyard is three lands, a desperate ritual, a ragavan, a disciple of all and a deadly relic. My graveyard doesn't do anything. And they're like, is this a problem? And they're looking, they're like, he has the LED. And I'm like, if I sack the LED, I have a Necropotence, so my entire hand will be exiled and won't be able to use the parts. And they're like, oh, that's true. Um, and then he ends me, he's like, if, are you just gonna Rollick? And I was like, I'm gonna see what the Firebrand Archer gets me. That's kind of my priority right now. And he goes, okay, well, if if you agree not to Rollick my Eureka, then I'm okay with it. I'm like, cool, I will not Rollick your Eureka, that is fine. And so, <laughs> and so my Underworld Breach resolves, my Firebrand Archer trigger gets me a Mox Opal, and I'm like, cool, cast Mox Opal, trigger Firebrand Archer, keep going. Um, and then I'm in this position, I'm like, okay, I have access to like six mana, including the LED, and I really, the, the most important card in my entire deck right now is the grinding station I have in hand. And now I'm in a position that I have four mana, like regardless, I have four mana without using the LED, I think. And so I'm like, I'm gonna tap two, I'm gonna cast a grinding station. They snap pass on it. But my thought process was if he uses his offer, you can't refuse that he had revealed he had on the grinding station, I can still cast the grinding station. And so that was the most important card to me. I didn't care about the Firebird Archer at that point for triggers because Grinding Station Breach gets there. I have the Rollick for the Mayhem Devil. I'm not concerned about that. They let Grinding Station go. I immediately start grinding a couple cards. The guy forgets that that's a sacrifice and doesn't even trigger his Mayhem Devil. I start hitting Rite of Flame into Pyretic Ritual. You know, I end up casting a Jessica's Will that at this point he feels like he has to pass on. I end up casting ping, Jessica's Will ping, twice. It finds me Sensei Stop. Yeah, at this point... <laughs> Every single thing I cast gets him to a ping. I end up in a position where I reveal Delayed Blast Fireball off the top with, with five floating red mana. Eureka is at three life. Magda is at nine life. And I say, cool, use three red Delayed Blast Fireball, a spell that I know he has to Flusterstorm. And by Flusterstorming it, and when I cast it, he's at three. Firebrand Archer Trigger puts him to two. Tapping the Cephalic Coliseum to cast the Flusterstorm puts him to one. He flusters it, I snap pass on it. He's at exactly one life. Magda's now at eight life. And I say, cool, two remaining red mana. Here's a great shot from hand that kills both of you. I just needed the fluster gone. Once the fluster was gone, I could grape shot and I was chill. Storm count was like 15 at that point. Yep. And uh, and I moved and I, I won my game with much patience. And we moved on to the final four pod with two Rakdos decks, baby. Yeah, hell yeah. And I'm <laughs> sitting there, at that point, I'm sitting there waiting in the uh, in the, the, the Colors Are Crush Discord, just waiting for you to come back in and see what happened. Just like, no idea, like I already had top four. I'm like, is he gonna make it too? Is the dream gonna come true? Are we gonna make it? And sure enough, you joined the Discord and like you were as pumped as I was and we were like going nuts, man. It was so cool. Yeah, it was, it was so <laughs> cool. It was so wild. It was so great. Um, I mean, it was just crazy that we both did it. It was like actually crazy. I, it does yeah? I, I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Honestly, it's great. It's unbelievable. Like that we would have this conversation a week ago, and then actually just do it. Like just talk about it and then do it. It's like freaking Babe Ruth style, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Um, Called the shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, congratulations, yeah. dude. It was it was amazing. Amazing. Thank you, thank so, you. And then we had to. And yeah, we, we played, we talked about it. We played our top 16 games very similarly, where we kind of sat back, we directed the table on what the problems were, we kind of convinced people to use things at a certain point. And then we even, like, were talking to them during our winter, and we're like, you can use this here. Oh, and even <laughs> it was funny. You, you remember my quote when, it, when the breach was on the stack? I was like, my graveyard doesn't use shit. You want to counter my breach? Feel free, my yeah, guy. Yeah, that's right. That's, you know? right. <laughs> that's right. Same thing with, like, I cast a Tainted Pact. I'm like, I mean, you could counter this if you want to, but. Wouldn't you rather just counter what I get? <laughs> and they're like, and they're like, hey, I guess that's true. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic. Boy. But then we had to sit around and wait for a while because the, the the other the last of the top sixteen pods took a long time. Um, you know, the world who who was on the Kark Sakashima, uh, his pod finished I think even earlier than yours did. 
Um, but the yeah, around the same time. Yeah, but the Barneas, the Barneas player time. TTC, his pod took a really long. It was like a two-hour game before it finally ended. Um, it was more than two hours. That game was. I don't even know. It was long. I don't know. It was long. <laughs> it was like two and a half. It was like two. I think I remember because Mox Masters posted the the videos today on YouTube, and that one I think was like two hours forty for top sixteen, which is where they were following that game. Yeah. So so TTC was like, I need a ten minute break, which is like, okay, I if it was if I were you, I'd take like thirty minutes. I'd be exhausted. But, yeah. But, yeah. Shit was wild. Yeah, but he took he took like a ten minute break, and then you know we we were ready to go and fired up and. You know, got got our got our mulligans on. Um, you were in second seat. I was in fourth seat. We had Mardeus in first, and um, Kark Sakashima in third seat. Um, you know what? What did you? What were your moles like? What did you end up doing? What was your strategy? What were you thinking going into the game? Well, I am I am notorious for mulliganing super fucking low in finals and top sixteen pods because I just can't get a goddamn keepable hand. So I was pretty hyped when I saw a reasonable second seven. My my second seven was Arid Mesa, Ancient Tomb. Wait, I think I took a picture of it actually. Yep. Okay. My my second seven was Ancient Tomb, Arid Mesa, Dockside, Deflecting Swat, Wish Claw, Beseech the Mirror, Reckless Fire Reaver. And in my brain, I'm like, is that the quick ob hand? No. Does it have a quick citadel? Maybe not. Does it have a quick nas? Maybe not. Does that hand have inevitability of doing something? Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah, it mm-hmm. does. And I was like, and this is also a hand that lets me chill the first two turns. And hopefully you get dealt with, was kind of my thought. Oh, I yeah. was like, let oh, them yeah. blow some interaction on oh, you, yeah. and then I come in turn three and try some shit. And so I, you know, what what did you yeah, do? Yeah. I mean, you mauled a five, yeah, I had right? a pretty rough, pretty rough, rough maul. Um, and my first two hands were basically no land hands. I think one of them had one land. Um, and then my six had no lands at all. And so I finally, I'm like, all right, I got to find something. And my, my whole thought process going into the malls was, okay, this is going to be a grindy game. Like, I thought it was going to be a grindy game. I did not want to be the, the one to try to pop off first. I wanted that to be you. Um, so so my plan was, let's let's get a good Florian battle plan here. I want to get Florian. I want to get uh, a, a couple of value creatures. A buddy. Yeah, Florian and a buddy. <laughs> and I just want to start punching people, create some treasures, you know, get some, get some hits off of Florian and just... Like wait for a window and, and try to set up protection to go for it. Um, so I ended up keeping a five that was it was a um, a land, a dark ritual, a talisman, a ragavan, um, um, professional face breaker, and I don't remember what the last card was. I think it was a D SWAT again. Yeah, D SWAT. I think. Yeah. yeah oh, you also yeah. had D SWAT. Yeah, fucking whole fucking game. game. <laughs> yeah. So I so um, interestingly, yeah, I guess so. That's what I kept, and I, you know, my thought process is. You know, drop a Ragavan early, and then get uh, you know Florian on board turn two, and then Facebreaker on board turn three, and then just see where we go from there. Um, that was basically my plan, um, which felt, I, I, and that's kind of what I you know I ended up doing. So I mean that worked, um, but you know, yeah. before we get into like how things unfolded, like um, you know let's let's start talking through each turn, like um, you know, and we don't. Yeah, I mean Marnius went uh, land pass. Yeah. And then I wanted to look unthreatening. So I literally went land, crack it for tapped blood crypt. Yeah, you did. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't even want them to think I was holding up a band or something. I was just like, tap, pass. On a second seven, they're like, huh? And then, I mean, Crux Crux turned one. Well, he did did exactly our worst nightmare. I mean, what he did was exactly what we did not want to see. Yeah. But but it was it was a top deck. His his starting hand had Mana Crypt, Jeweled Lotus, Mox Ember land in it. It did not have the Ristic Study. He top decked the Ristic Study on turn one, and so then he went land, Mana Crypt, Ristic Study, Jeweled Lotus, Mox Ember. Did not cast Kark Sokka because he then wanted to use because he'd already used the Mana Crypt and the Ristic. He then didn't have turn one Kark and Sokka, and so he wanted to save it so he could tap the Jeweled Lotus for three to help cast both of them on the following yeah, turn. Yeah. So I went to my turn, and um, oh, actually. Him two well, cards. well, so actually, it's a little bit more than that because uh, Marnaeus didn't just go land pass; he played land Imperial Seal pass. No, he enlightened Enlight- tutored. Oh. He enlightened tutored with the Ristic on the oh, stack. Oh, was it enlightened tutor? Okay, you're right. He enlightened tutored. Yes. And he put he put a mana crypt. Yeah, on top. he put a mana crypt on top, and I go turn one, uh, dark ritual had to feed a card to uh, the Ristic study, and then I had a choice, right? Because I can I'm going to cast a talisman. And I could cast a talisman um, with a mana floating. I could dash Ragavan and I could steal that mana crypt. 
right? But if I did that, well, you missed you missed that well, line. You missed well, that line. I, I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it because my thought process was, well, hold on, hold on. So no, so <laughs> so if I did that, if I were to do that, right? I did think it through initially. So um, and then I thought I made a mistake by doing it um, after the fact. But what I did, what my thought process initially was, okay, if I do that, right? I'm going to pay. I'm not going to pay for Ristic for the monkey. Monkey's going to come into play. I'm not going to pay for Ristic on the crypt, right? Because I need to cast uh, Florian next turn. So I'm going to feed it, feed two car two more cards there, and then next turn I'm going to feed two more cards because I'm going to play the monkey again, and I'm going to play Florian. So that's four cards I'm going to feed him, right? Instead, I paid for the Ristic, just cast Ragavan and passed. And then next turn I was set up to attack with the monkey. And play Florian, and if I could draw a land, then I could do both. So, in any case, like, and then immediately, uh, and then, I, I, and then I, I think you should have. Well, immediately, it. I, I, I immediately, I agree with you. I, no, I agree with you. Immediately realized it was a mistake, and that I shouldn't have paid for the Ristic study, and I should have just dashed the monkey and got the crit. So, oops, my mistake. Yeah, I fucked that up. Um, because even if you dash the monkey, you get the treasure to pay for the crypt. So you feed him one more yeah. card, but you get yeah, that's crypt. fair. So I misplayed. So I, first game, I mean, I mean, first first play in the game, I misplayed. I should have dashed the monkey and stolen the crypt, but I didn't. Um, but you know, in my head, I was locked into my plan, which was you know, turn turn one Ragavan, turn two Florian, turn three Face Breaker, and see where it goes. So in any case, yeah. yeah. Still, still fed this fucker. Too I much. did, but I had no choice. I could not do nothing. Like there was yeah, no, yeah, yeah. there was no world yeah, that I yeah, do nothing there. Um, but in any case, and I was like, TT, TTC was so bad about paying for Ristic this entire game. Oh my god! I mean, he untaps on his next turn, and he plays the Mana Crypt. I think pays for Ristic on the Mana Crypt, and then taps the Mana Crypt, plays a Talisman, doesn't pay. Yeah. So I mean, and that you know? was kind of the theme for a lot of the game was that like like Ristic got fed, like got fed, and like. I didn't. I tried. Like, I didn't so feed I, it. I didn't feed it. So anything. go back and watch. Like, I, <laughs> I paid my freaking taxes. Like, I, you know, other than a couple sure. of occasions where I couldn't, I paid my taxes, dude. I paid taxes over. To, I was sacking treasures to pay pay taxes like throughout the game. Um, I paid for every single Ristic study trigger except for one until like turn six. Yeah. yeah. The only so my my next turn, my turn two after TTC does that, I I play Ancient Tomb. And I play Wish Claw paying for Ristic Pass. Yeah. That's it. And I don't think we have to go through every single turn. Like, so. You want me to? I can quick summarize it if you want me to just. Well, let's, run. let's just go through, like, the major parts of, of the game. Sure. I mean, so after after I do the Wish Claw Pass on the following turn, Quark Sakashima ends up casting Quark and Sakashima. With the Sakashima on the stack, uh, TTC ends up mini rifting the Quark. Uh, he gets it back to hand. Uh, he then casts a Harmonic Prodigy and he passes the turn. You go into your second turn, you swing with Florian, you end up hitting a land, I believe. So you hit your land drop and then you pass a turn you're swinging at ttc or you swung at me with the ragavan you swung at me with that ragavan and you hit a land off and he goes next out whatever ttc on his following turn uh ends up just kind of playing a land leaving up a bunch of mana and passing i believe and we go into my third turn of the game which is where i kind of shot my first sort of win attempt at this point i'm looking at a hand that is fucking beseech the mirror deflecting swat uh dock side like I i'm looking ready reckless fiber i'm looking ready to go you got get probed right and when did so you get get probed was that I didn't get get probed. I got op. Oh, yeah, that's right. So Opera. what happened yeah, yeah, yeah. was I I I cast the dock side and I did not pay for the Ristic study on this one trigger so I could use the floating mana to activate the Wish Claw with the Dockside study trigger on the stack. And I did that because I wanted to see if the Dockside resolved before I used the Wish Claw. And that means I get an extra treasure on the Dockside while also making sure that it resolves. So I waited till everyone passed on the Dockside, Dockside resolves, ETB trigger in the stack, hold priority, activate Wish Claw, he flashes an opposition agent. And I revealed to him a hand that has the same cards I already mentioned, and I think the only new card was um, Wheel of Misfortune which the casting group was talking about, why am I not casting this wheel for like the entire game? He ends up taking Lightning Bolt out of my deck. Lightning Bolt's the Harmonic Prodigy because now that I've been stopped, that's the concern. Really frustratingly, knowing my hand at this point, it doesn't do anything. I needed to Beseech the Mirror and the Wish Claw to be able to do anything. So it was frustrating for me that he had seen my hand and I was saying, right now I cannot do anything. And he was arguing that I couldn't because the Dockside is already done. So there's no way for me to get additional Reckless Fire Weaver triggers. So I end up making seven treasures. I crack, um, Four of them for Obnixilis paying for Ristic Study, and I, and I, or no, I, I crack one treasure, pay a Mana Crypt for my hand, then I tap the Mana Crypt and, and, and three treasures paying for Ristic Study for Obnixilis, pass the And at this point, well, and I get like, I, I, no yeah, pings. And that, that, that's a big part of, the, of what was going on at that point was you were looking for pings at that point. You're trying to get some pings. We were hoping for you to start swinging at, at Krakashima, 
uh, because uh, he was getting kind of scary and we were hoping that we could get you to use up Nexus as a bit of a battering ram against his life total put pressure on him um, and you were like basically like you know your 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 political game at that point was okay I want pings then so that was the negotiation was yeah. if you give me pings I'll swing up next to us and and both uh, you know TTC and I uh, and and Car kind of talked about it a bit and I was like we're not giving this guy pings like I'm not giving you pings I know what up next does with pings I don't want him to grow that much and I don't want you to get that many cards um, so we we, yeah. we didn't do it and you stood your ground we stood your ground we stood our ground um, and the swings yeah. didn't come um, which I, I stand by my decision because my thought process there was my life total is really important because I have been stopped on my tutors, which means my best outs in that game are Citadel and Adnaz off of the top. So I really want to preserve my life total. And if I swing with Obnixos, I have no blockers for your oncoming Florian attacks, which are going to like start hitting me for five to eight damage a turn yeah. at this yeah. point. And so I do not want to risk my life total. And my thought process as well was Nip Mizzet got off to, or, sorry, not Nip Mizzet, uh, Karkashima got off to such a cracked ass start here. I did not think the game was going much longer. Like I thought it would be over in a couple of turns here pretty quickly. And so in my brain, it's like Obnixos is four power they're giving me zero pings that is six attacks to kill him versus my argument was if you give me pings it becomes three attacks yeah. Yeah. and so if you guys are saying it's if you guys are saying it is three attacks to kill him sure i will yeah. kill him if you are not going to give me pings i am not going to sacrifice my life total on the hope that the game goes six more turns right and that's i think where we we collectively misplayed a little bit is we should have had this conversation where we should have said okay you don't want you don't want me swinging florian and my and my and my guys at you because right? you don't you care about your life total and i really want you to be swinging ob over at karkashima so how about we make a deal where i won't swing my guys at you and you swing your guys over at karkashima and i think if we had done that if we had that conversation um maybe the game goes differently who knows but um you know we didn't do that so yeah. whatever um the other thing is you know we just kept answering um karkashima like over and over and over again i mean all of us took a turn removing either Krark or uh, a, you know a clone effect or a storm kill Narnist at one point a, the the prodigy like we just like would not let him get traction um and, and no. which uh, on his following turn though he he does have the Krark and Sakashima he's drawn cards off the risk he's in a very threatening position where there's a chance he wins the game well but here. Sakashima was still and Sakashima had, not Krark right at that point Sakashima is still Sakashima but he had right. the Krark and so he ends up in a position where he starts casting uh alchemist retrieval to bounce like his stuff and, you know, it, it forms a loop because he also had a Stormkill Artist. He plays Stormkill Artist, so you're like, oh my god, he has all the card cards here. We're really scared. And the Alchemist Retrieval on the stack, you guys are trying, like, he says, oh, my hand is lands Arcade Signet Dignity Mizzet. And you guys are immediately trying to politic me into using my Deflecting Swat. And this is where the emotions really started to rise in the game. Because if anyone has ever met me and anyone who knows me well, I really do not like being cut off. If it happens once, I don't care. But if it happens repeatedly, that's something that does piss me off when you constantly cut off me trying to talk. And so I was trying to have a conversation with the world because he said, I have lands, arcane taking and visit, which in my brain is, I don't give a fuck what you're doing right now. I'm not using my deflecting swat. And so I kept saying, can I talk to world? And then I would get cut off by TTC. He would start talking and doing and trying to politic me into using it. And then I would say, and they would stop and I would start trying to say something and he would immediately cut me off again. And that to me is incredibly frustrating. And I fucking hate when people do that. And that's when like our emotions got very heated that game between me and TTC, which has happened before. It is not my first game against him. This has happened before when we've played against each other. It, we don't get along and that's okay. You're not gonna like everybody in the world and that's fine. Um, and so, yeah, I got very frustrated. And uh, finally, they, they, they stopped talking where I could say, okay, I'm talking to the world now. World, uh, you say you have lands or canes to visit. Are you willing to reveal that? He goes, yes, shows his hand. I go, okay, snap pass. That was all I cared about. Nothing you guys said in that entire five minute block meant anything to me. I was just trying to talk to the world. <laughs> and Fair so he, yeah. he passes the turn at that point and, and it goes to you on your next one. You play the, you play the professional face breaker, you swing in. Um, I forget what you hit on this one. That one, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't think it was anything oh, no, no, no. super relevant. Did he relevant. cast Invisit on that turn? He cast no. No, no, no. Invisit. Invisit was yeah, the Yeah, I don't remember turn. what I cast. It was, it the was following turn. Not, yeah, it wasn't anything significant. Might just been another land. Might just been another land or something. Yeah, I don't remember. I think you were just hitting land drops, and then you go into TTC's next turn. Um, again, he has an opposition agent on the board at this point. I think he casts an Esper Sentinel here, and and you know starts like just holding up his mana. He was just playing reactive the entire game. Um, I do not believe he cast Marnius yet. He was just kind of chilling. We go to my he was reactive the whole game. That was his whole game plan. Like, the whole game. Yeah, very, very reactive. His whole reactive. game plan was, I'm not going to try and win yeah, this Yeah, I don't game. think there was any point, uh, was there any point I can think of in that entire match where I was worried that he was going to win, and there wasn't. Uh, it just, it, was, no. it never happened. Um, it was like Natty Thoracle or nothing, pretty yeah, much, in my yeah, brain. Yeah. And he, he didn't have it. I mean, he started drawing cards off the Esper and stuff, where, like, I, I did my best to pay for it, but... 
get yeah, out. I, I uh, mean, we go to my following turn. I was fine. Fe- I was I, fine I feeding. I, played, uh, I was fine feeding him a, a few cards at that point because you know, his interaction was keeping yeah. me in the game. So I was fine with it. Hundred yeah. percent. Which which was was totally fine. I'm not saying yeah. that, that was incorrect at all. I think we, you guys both needed to do better on paying for Ristic. You did better than TTC. TTC like really just like he would just be like, I need to hold up interaction, not pay for Ristic. And it's like, okay, I understand you need to hold up some amount of interaction, but you do have to pay for some stuff. Or like Krakashima has the most mana, the most cards, the, the best situation by a mile. Like we keep dealing with him, but at the same time, if you keep giving him new things, that's what your interaction is going to be used on, mm-hmm. which was really surprising. So I was I was frustrated that he kept, he kept feeding him so many cards. I mean, we'll get to one turn later that was just like ridiculous with it. But on my turn, I just untap, I play Ragavan, I play Reckless Fire Weaver, I pass the turn. I pay for Ristic on both of them. You know, I take two life from my Ancient Tomb to pay for Ristic and I pass the turn. Once again, I say, if you guys aren't giving me pings, I'm not swinging with Ob. And then, and you know, I I think I've gotten zero pings from Ob at this point. Like it still is a four power creature. I might've gotten one off of a Mana Vault from Krark. That might've just been the following turn that's coming up though. Like that was it. I really got nothing. And so you go to Krakashima's next turn, he... He casts a clone effect, it copies my Dockside, he makes a shitload of treasures, he plays an Invisit, he passes. Because he doesn't have anything. He still like just wasn't drawing well, his hand was a shitload of lands at this point. He might have gotten Arcane Signa into an Invisit or something like that. Um, yeah, and, and then, then that's... You, you untap, yeah, that's when I got... When you when you then, your next Florian attack got the Red Blast right. to kill an Invisit. Right, so that's yeah. A, yeah, that's the turn I removed an Invisit at that point with the Red Um, I did pay for yeah. Ristic on the, on the Red Blast, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I paid for a lot of risks, and I was nice. Yeah, but but right. then at that oh. point, from my perspective, watching the game unfold, like after I red blasted the Niv Mizzet and having uh, Krark already reveal his hand a few turns before, like I was much less concerned about Krark other than the fact that he was still drawing so many cards off of off of the Ristic, right? But at that point, I'm starting to look at your board and be concerned, right? Because I think you had you had the Reckless Fire Reaver, you had the Ragavan, which had is Ragavan a nice little Ob. combination. You had Ob. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a Mana Vault on Karkashima's board that was occasionally giving you a ping as well. And you're starting to snowball just a little bit. And I didn't feel like everyone was kind of uh, wary enough of what was going on there because they were kind of just ignoring you at that point. Um, the thing was, my hand was known. And my hand didn't do anything. Yeah, but so I like, was a good like yeah, the, the real. Yeah, but, I mean, I was never concerned about your hand. I was concerned about the exiles off of the pings. That was my biggest concern. Right, but yeah. it, it only gives me one a turn from the ragamuffin, so I get one additional look at a card every turn, which is really not that crazy compared to Krark getting like four extra cards. A turn. Yeah, you know what well, I mean. Was it the next turn you got? So got when I, did you get the parasite? Was it the next turn cycle or? No, 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 yeah. no, 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 not yet. The parasite is way later. So, so on the following turn cycle. Yes, yeah, so I think I think what happened here is on the following turn cycle, it might have been one more pass this, I'm not sure. There were a lot of turns in this yeah, game. Yeah. But I end up top decking a Parasite, and then when I hit you with the Ragavan, the Reckless Fire Weaver trigger gets me Bolas to Citadel to exile. And so my thought process there is I'm like, I can cast the Citadel, and that's my spell, but, and, and like a Silence doesn't stop there, but my thought is I want to play this Parasite, because then if we have an interaction battle and there's risk study triggers, I get to see more cards. Sure, that makes sense. So I I cast the Parasite first, and with the Parasite on the stack, uh, Marnius Tainted packs and ends up digging pretty deep where he hits a Silence. And he just casts the Silence. And, and I say very quickly, like, that's fine. I have nothing for Silence. And this was where the game, I think, got really out of hand because I, I do think, like, I understand it is a threat, but I think given the situation at the table, the way you and TTC handled this mystical tutor to quote unquote find an answer to my parasite was incredibly overblown. I disagree with how this was handled. I know you're gonna have your own opinions on it, that's fine. But so what happened here, the parasite lands, everyone is silenced, and then in my end step, they're talking about this mystical tutor fucking constantly because they know he has in hand and he has an oppo. So he's just like, do the mystical tutor. And Krug's like, well, I get a Krug trigger, so you'd get two mystical tutors if this resolves. And that's like terrifying to me. Like, why would we give this guy two mystical tutors? And he's like, well, I'll get removal for the parasite. I'll get removal for the parasite. And I'm like, the parasite's gonna look at three cards here. We're drawing Krug fucking like five, six cards a turn. Like, is the is the parasite really the biggest problem? And fortunately, Krakashima, they had the Psycrypt in hand. They had all these answers. They weren't really worried about it, but it ended up getting this really slow, political, heated game state where like, Every phase of the game, during my, during the Parasite on the stack, while the Silence was on the stack, they were talking about it. During my end step, they kept talking about the Mystical Tutor. During his upkeep before he drew, you guys kept talking about the Mystical Tutor. It took like 10 to 15 minutes between the Silence on the stack to his fucking draw step of just talking and trying to convince this guy to use his Mystical Tutor. And he 
thank God, was just like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, he was like, I don't need to do that yet. Like, relax, guys. And it was the same thing of every time where, like, once again, when I would try and start talking, I would get cut off. I would get angry about being cut off. And, and emotions got pretty heated during this part of the game. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that, he ends up giving yeah, me... Go ahead. Yeah. 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 He ends up giving me a couple of triggers between, you know, he got the Kadaric Parasite trigger, which gave me one card in exile, which was like, I think it was a fucking land or something relevant. And then um, the next one from your draw step hit something else that was, I don't remember exactly what it was. I mean, my biggest concern at that point is you had a situation where you had Omnixilis, you had Reckless Fireweaver, you had Karadect Parasite, and you had Ragavan all in play, which meant that every single turn cycle, you were seeing at least three cards off the Parasite and one card off of the Ragavan. That means you're looking at four cards every single turn and you're growing Obnixilis by four counters every single turn. So my point to the table, and I was trying to raise this awareness, was that you were in position to run away with the game on your next turn, right? And if not that next turn, the turn after. Like it was going to get out of control very, very quickly. So what I was trying to do was I was trying to get the table to respond to that and see if there was a way that we could answer your board state, set you back, and stop that snowball from happening. So that was the goal. And the conversation about the Mystical Tutor was simply that the Mystical Tutor presented a, a way to maybe accomplish that, right? Um, so um, eventually, I mean, he, you know, I don't remember what happened eventually. Eventually he just had the Psych Rift. He had the answer the whole time, that's the thing. Yeah, he, he had right. the answer, so that's my, why so, he didn't Right, care. so my argument still was correct, is that you needed to be answered. The, the only thing that was wrong was that the answer was already there and he just wasn't using it, right? Which makes sense, you know, knowing what the answer was and kind of like in retrospect makes sense. Although if it were me, I don't know that I would wait a whole turn cycle to, to do the answer, um, but it worked out for him. I so. think it was fine to wait. It worked out for him. Yeah, it worked yeah. out. I mean, so so my Kadaric Parasite trigger on his draw step was a Chrome Box. And then my Kadaric Parasite trigger on your draw step was Yawgmoth's Will, where my land at that time was only, or my graveyard at that time was a land and a lightning bolt. So the Yawgmoth's Will was really not relevant. Um, but then on your turn, you had the Bergy Horn. Oh, that was what? Your previous turn, you hit the Bergy Horn on the Florian trigger. It just tapped out, cast it, drew him a card. Yeah. That was your previous turn. You had four cards in hand. At this point, you have five cards in hand. You start discarding and you're hitting gas. You hit Dockside, Chrome Mox, Tain Impact, Simeon Spirit Guide. Um, you had Conquer's the, um, Flail, right? what's it called? Conqueror's Flail. And you hit Mana Crypt. Like your, your hits were really, really good. So I believe it was when you went to combat, he said, fuck it. Or no, it was no, when I you put the Dockside on the yeah, stack. Dockside on the stack. It was Dockside on the stack. He overloaded the Psych Rift, which resulted in a few more Parasite Triggers that got me LED, Wheel of Fortune and Conqueror's Flow in Exile. And at that point, the Psych Rift is resolving. Um, I crack my five treasures that I have built up for five red yep. mana because my draw one or two turns before was a final fortune. And I'm looking at the Psych Rift and I'm like, man, if I can bait them into using a little more interaction, I win the game here. Like it gets me back my Wishclaw Talisman. TTC is tapped out. If I can final fortune and skip his turn, like I'm pretty sure I got this. And your Dockside resolves. The ETB trigger gets trick binded by Marnius with his two floating mana from his treasures because he had a Grim Hireling going at this point, which I think we missed talking about. Um, and then you're in a position that you go to equip the Conqueror's Flail to Dockside. And that is where I hold priority because I'm thinking about this final fortune. And I, I kicked myself a lot for this. I ended up having, like I've had multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations with the world about this game, talking through an interaction he had at different times. If I had Final Fortune, I would not have succeeded. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, so, good to know. That's good to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, because so so he had the stern scolding and the reason he snapped past on my dock side, our conversations about this game, he was like, I, I just let you and TCC duke it out. It was so clear to me that he did not like you and that he wanted to just fuck you over and I knew he was going to counter your dock side. Which, I mean, talking to, like, a bunch of people about this game afterwards, everyone was absolutely baffled that he used this mana drain on my dock side. Which we can get to. We can get so, to in a second. So, so um, did he, what it, else did, did the world have anything besides Stern Scolding in his hand? Uh, other yes, answers? Yes, he had Stern Scolding, Dispel, Fierce Guardianship. Oh, Jesus. Um, yeah, so. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he, he was in a really, really good okay. spot at this yeah. point. And so, but but then the Psych Rift resolves, you know, you get your dock side, the ETB gets trick binded, you cast a Conqueror's Flail, I think you even like drop a card because you're like, whatever, this is what I got. And you're looking at it, you're like, this Tainted Pack and stuff in exile, you sadly have to let it go, you pass the TTC's turn. But yeah, we go to we go to TTC's turn, I mean, he, he untaps, he rebuilds, and the entire time he's like, I have to hold up mana for interaction, draws him like four or five cards on the Ristic Study, which was a little baffling to me that like, he's in this incredibly dominant board state, he has just Psych Rifted all of us. And you'd like know he's going to win on his next turn. So I was surprised that you would just feed him 
four to five more cards. Um, and we go to my next turn here and I'm like, well, this is kind of like, I have to shoot a shot at this point. This is just what I got. So I end up, um, first thing I do is cast my Dockside, which after TTC's rebuild, your artifacts in the battlefield, the ones that, you know, Kargashima had left over was probably going to make me, I think it was something around 10 treasures, which would have been really good. Uh, because the world knew about me and TTC's frustrations with each other and, and TTC openly saying, don't go for it. I have a hard counter. You know, he was like, cool, pass to you. I'm not going to start scolding your Dockside. TTC mana drains it, which, I mean, my conversations with people who have watched this game, they were baffled that he used the mana drain of my Dockside going into, like, what Krakatshima's turn was and how much we knew we needed interaction. So my Dockside gets mana drained. I replay Mana Crypt. I replay Chrome Mox. I try and Yogg's Will to get back my Dockside. That gets fierced by uh, Krakatshima. And at that point, I am in a position that I have... Uh, I have my LED on the battlefield, I have Wheel of Fortune in Exile, I have a Chrome Mox, and I have a land. And so I, I tap the Chrome Mox in the land, I cast Cabal Ritual, go up to three black, cast the Wish Claw, have one mana floating. I, I, I do all the math in my head and I'm like, we deterministically lose to Krokoshima here. I have to do something. And so in my brain, I have one mana floating. My exact line is I need to cast this Wheel of Fortune, discard my gas as fuck hand of like deflecting swap, beseech the mirror, like all these things I want, you know, my reckless fire weaver, my Kaderic Parasite, everything that I've like worked to build in this entire game. I need to wheel into exactly Underworld Breach and any mana source because I hadn't played a land for turn. And um, I say, fuck it. I cast the Wheel of Fortune. In response, the Krakashima uh, player Mystical Tutors, I do think TTC should have oppoed here. I think we're just in like we're in such a fuck spot i have only one mana floating after this wheel he he said very clearly he had the stern scolding for the oppo but i think make this man use his resource but he he doesn't use it so he um he gets the board upon a win on top of the mystical tutor and then the wheel of fortune resolves and in my top seven cards i have underworld breach i have multiple lands and this is my this is my shot to try and win the game i play a land i tap to i cast underworld breach krakashima snap passes doesn't have an answer to it yet you pass on it. TTC did have a Pact of Negation, decides to fee feed Krark a card with a um, Dramatic Reversal to just untap his Mana Crypt and Mox Diamond he had in play, feeds Krark the card, then they cast Born Upon Wind, then they cast Ponder, then they cast Spellseeker, then they Swan Song my Breach, and my turn is over at that point. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't, I don't think I had a better line than that. I think given what I was presented in the situation I was in with that game, I, I completely stand by all of my decisions. And talking through the interaction that existed, I don't think I had a line that wins the game there, which is unfortunate. Um, but, no, you know, I don't think, we, we shot our best shot. I, I think shot. both of us had like what we thought would have been kind of an outside shot at a win. Mine being that turn before when I had the horn, and I exiled cards to the horn, and I thought like there was a chance maybe if I could resolve the dock side, and then I had a tainted pact in exile that maybe that could get me to some to, to some kind of win. But the reality is I never had a shot. There was too much interaction available, um, and and same with your situation where like you almost had a shot but you didn't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so and that was I mean. I don't think I, I mean I did nothing else for the rest of that game. Um, you know, I tried to recast uh, you know, Florian because off the wheel, the only thing I really got with the wheel was a uh, uh, reanimate. Uh, so I was going to reanimate your dockside and then cast Florian and pass. And at that point, Krakus mm -hmm. like no reason to let anyone do anything. Um, so you know, he countered it and stopped me, and I could do nothing else for the rest of the game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you did anything else, right? I think that was kind of it for you as well, right? Is there any other stabs? No. At it? So what ended up happening now? I mean, I mean, Kark Karkashima. Yeah. No. I had a I had a really gas line the following turn that almost got there. Um, but so Karkashima on their following turn after my win attempt, they like tried but couldn't quite get there with get probes and stuff. But they saw your and TTC's hand. Um, he ended up getting I think it was his Jessica's will pact of negation or something. Um, and then yeah, I mean, you kind of had a turn that was pretty middling after the dog. Yeah, nothing left. Yeah. Was countered. Um, T TTC also like had a conversation on the end step before your turn where you know you didn't promise not to win, which was correct. You shouldn't have there, and so he swords your dock side to make sure the conqueror's flail wasn't on it. Um, and yeah, I mean it went back to TTC's turn. I think he like played Marnius or something. I'm, I don't even remember. He didn't play Marnius. And then I go to my he last turn. Yeah, I. And at this point, I, I think I am fucked in this game. Like, at this point, I'm like, there's no world that I have aligned to win this game. My hand does not accomplish anything. I have no tutors. I have no nothing. The oppo's in the graveyard at this point, so, like, that's not a concern. And, you know, I have a bunch of mana, and I have a sense I stop in hand. And so, and, and at this point, my my breach is in the yard. My Yogg's Will is in, is in exile. Like, or my, my Yogg's Will is in the yard. Like, all, all of my recursion to, like, find a line in this game is just gone. 
And so in my brain, I'm like, I need to hit, I need to hit Praetor's Grasp off the top. Like that is, I think my only out in this game at this point, because my Citadel was already in exile and I had a Magda in hand. So like, even if I could reanimate the Dockside, that wouldn't do it because my Citadel has gone. So like, I'm just, I'm just in like rough fucking shape at this point. Um, and so I, I untap on my turn and I'm like, well, I'm going to need every piece of mana for anything I could possibly hit. So I cast as I stop with the Mana Crypt. Don't pay for Ristic Grasper. Use the remaining floating mana to look at my top three, and in my top three is an Imperial Seal. And I immediately start cooking. <laughs> and I, I mean, if you go back and watch this, you see me spend like two and a half minutes just like counting mana a bunch of times, going through cards in my hand a bunch of times, and I end up realizing I have exact mana, exact oh, mana, right. not yeah. one mana yeah, over, not one mana short, where I could I could tap Sensei's top, get the Imperial Seal, cast Imperial Seal, put Praetor's Grasp on top, tap my Ancient Tomb, cast Grim Monolith, tap that in a land, float one, cast Jessica's Will for the three cards off the top because Ob is in the command zone, get the Praetor's Grasp, cast the Praetor's Grasp, targeting you, get your Breach, cast your Breach, exact mana for that line, and my Jessica's Will got my Break Trapped. Yep. Um, yep. yep. And that was it for me. I mean, I knew it was over for me at that point. I had no other. Uh, well, actually, no. It, it, technically, if it got back to me a following turn, I had the Praetor's Grasp on top, so I could fuck over your breach. Um, but yeah, at that point, that was it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I knew I was fucked. Yep. I knew I was screwed. And, that's, and that was that's it. Okay. Like, at that point, we were you both know? completely out of the game. And, uh, you know, I had nothing mm -hmm. left to do. Um, and Krark at that point was it that turn or maybe turn after that. I don't remember. It's just it's kind of irrelevant at this point. Oh, it was, it was, it was that, that turn, turn. dual caster. Yeah, yeah, he goes, he goes and yeah, does yeah. a dual caster mage, twin flame line. Um, but uh, Marnaeus, uh, TTC had a one ring that he had just cast, so he was protected. But you and I were not. Um, so uh, he mm -hmm. goes dual caster mage, twin flame, creates uh, specifically uh, fifteen thousand <laughs> uh, dual caster mages. Uh, a absolute rookie numbers. Yeah, really kind of disappointing. Like, absolute like, rookie numbers. Really disappointed with the whole tournament. Like that he would only pick fifteen thousand. <laughs> like at that point, you could do anything you want, um, and you pick fifteen thousand. Sure, okay, fine. A a anything below one trillion, I'm disappointed yeah. by. So he he goes and he swings out at both of us. Uh, I I block with my one creature. You block with your what two creatures? I had I had the swan and I had the mat and I had right. the magda. Uh, so uh, we. I had I blocked two. So we, we we get our two blocks in, and then we simultaneously die. Done. Dead. And then the game went for a couple more turns, and like what became a casual slog battle, where um, on the Krakashima's following turn, might have been two turns after. I'm not even sure. They um they were able to like read. They they had just come out on this like janky combo where me and you both thought it was Heat Shimmer that they were trying to cast heat shimmer which blinks the dual caster mage with the displacer kitten we were yeah. wrong um but but awkwardly ttc made the mistake of bouncing his one ring when he could have actually stopped this kill if he bounced like literally any of his creatures on his board because what he was trying to do was he was actually just looping his mana rocks with non-creature spells that were bounce effects to bounce off ttc's blockers and hit him with exaxes for combat damage so if he had ottawa and literally anything else ttc would have actually won that yeah. game uh, but, in, but instead, he, he hit the one ring, and then Krark went on an awesome, just like casual combat line. To, to <laughs> yeah, Krark Takashima wins with combat damage. That's the way the, the whole thing ended. And that was it. So congratulations, though. Congratulations to uh, to the world. He earned that win. I mean, he did so many amazing plays throughout the game. Stopped you and I over and over and over again. Survived, uh, um, you know, Marnaeus's interaction. <laughs> There's a lot of that, um, and landed that turn one Ristic study, which really I think is. What won the game eventually? The best, the best deck in the format is turn one. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you, you know what? I'm I'm <laughs> fucking proud of us. Like we did an amazing job. We both played extremely well throughout the tournament, um, and we made our you know made top four together. Um, and in the battle of of Nixless versus Florian, we concluded uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, no. I, I do want to mention here in the, in the battle of uh, in the battle of Obnixilis versus Florian. If you look at the final standings, Obnixilis, Throbdixilis finished in third, and Florian finished in fourth. Don't forget, that's right. That's, that's correct. Correct. But <laughs> and yes, I'm aware it means nothing. But let me. You got just, it. Like, you got it, buddy. You got it. And your your deck <laughs> is still in the database, and mine is not. Um, I did make sure. Uh, I hope they. I hope they change that now. They will not. They, they will not. That. It'll never happen. I made. I did make a make a stop there on on Monday morning just to say hi, yeah, to the D the database yeah. that I and, I and I said, can I, can I, can you put, can you put Schnob Daddy on the main page now, like for the yeah. love of God? Yeah, they won't. 
Which, hey, I do want to say, that was that was the first ever Florian top four in history. That was the first ever Omnixilis top four in history. And I am honestly very proud of myself because, like I said, that was my first ever tournament not playing Canon. Yeah. Like, that was that was my first ever yeah, non-Canon no, tournament, and I almost it, fucking won. It, it was, like, like, it was that's, fantastic. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. And the, just the fact that we sat here last week, talked about, like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go play this tournament. We're both going to make top four, and we're going to you know put Omnixilis against Florian. And we, like, went to this big tournament, and we did exactly what we said. So we did it. We did it. Um, we did it. You know, so, you know, we'll see what happens next. Uh, you know, I think you'll go back to Kinnon and find Kinnon. Like, you could play Kinnon 10 times better than you could before. But yeah, it was, it was good. Blue. To, fuck yeah, blue. fuck blue. I think that's the conclusion <laughs> yeah, of all. You do, not, you do not need blue to win tournaments, dude. You don't need them. You could do it without. You know. Yeah, blue deck won, but yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, you can make top four. Well, you're going to win eventually. You make enough top fours, you're going to win. You can try. You know. I don't as know. Long I'm as, over as long eight, as you're not, bro. as long as you're not you, <laughs> eventually you get away. I'm over eight. <laughs> oh my god, it's yeah. so sad. This one, this one though, like I, you know, we've talked about all my tournament games the last few months, and they're all like, oh, I lost on turn three on a plague. I just had it. Not That's draw, not what happened. I did once again. I did once again lose to a nut draw of turn one Ristic Jewel Lotus Mox Amber. That was a nut draw. You're not but wrong. it was a three hour yeah. game. It was a grind fest. I got to actually put up win attempts. It was a very good game of Magic. That I mean, a bunch of people told us after the game, they were like, that was riveting. Like, that was a, everyone was locked in. That was an entertaining game. That game was wild. Yeah. Like, when I when I wheeled and just hit the land breach, everyone was like, holy shit. Like, they thought it was over. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was a, a hell of game. a game. I had a good time. I had a great time. Can't wait to do it again. We will be at the boil in a couple weeks. I was weeks, thinking about it. It's not that, it's not that yeah. far away. Yeah, boils in just Ten a couple days. weeks here. Super excited for that. Uh, the play to win episode that I'm going to be on is going to come out in nice, a few days. Nice, nice. That I'm, that I'm super excited for. Yeah. That should be this next yeah. Sunday. We're at, we're at like um, 920 subscribers right now. So hopefully, you know, people watching this, please, please, please subscribe, please. <laughs> get please. A, get us to 1,000. <laughs> get so us close. to 1,000. We're so close. Yeah, so... Hey, like a month, a month and a half ago, we were at four hundred. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. I want to quickly run over this meta. Very, very oh fast. yeah, very very yeah, yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah. That is our thing. That you're is right, our thing. Right. Uh, which the meta, I mean, absolutely crazy. Just like to quickly summarize it, if you're looking at total entries, blue farm pretty normal. Thirteen entries, three top six scenes. Blue farm is doing incredibly well right now. What I am beyond fucking disappointed by. <laughs> What what is bothering me till no fucking end? I take one fucking tournament off of Kinnon. One fucking tournament. There were thirteen goddamn Kinnon entries and zero top sixteen. Where are my bonded prodigies at? Yeah. Where are my tropical island tribe members? What is what is going on? Yeah. Like it's why? Because, it's because Rakdos just dominated. <laughs> like if you look at it for a second, right? There were thirteen Kinnons, eleven Sisses. There were five Atraxas and four Tivets. And guess how many of those decks top 16? Zero. Zero. The top 16 was three blue farms, um, three blue farms, two Tevish Kroms out of nine entries, two Najilas out of five entries, one Obnixilis out of three entries, one Krakashim out of two entries, one Marnius Calgar out of two entries, one Florian out of one mm -hmm. entry, one Bruce Thras out of three, one Dihada out of two, one Magda out of two, one Kedis Malcolm out of two, and one Eureka out of one. Yep. And then looking at these other top decks, I mean, just mind blowing. Kinnon 13 0, Sisse 11 0, Atraxa 5 0, Tivit 4 0, Rocco 3 0. Like all these, you know, Corval just to mention three entries. And, and zero. not not a like, single uh, Rockside in the whole tournament, not a single entry. Wait, was there none even zero. entered? Dude, Rockside is just up and down. Rockside is just like it has it has ten entries or zero. I don't it's understand. Because, what it's is going because on. of the cabal. There's like ten guys who play Rockside, and if they happen to be somewhere else oh. that weekend, then there's no Rockside. There wasn't. There was. There was an internal yes. tournament. This yeah, past weekend, that's what so happened. So, so yeah. either those guys play Rockside or no one plays Rockside. It's yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. I <laughs> hey I I do I do want to run a tournament on Rogsai. If anyone has a Rog Silas deck that they would like to send me to borrow, I will quickly ship it back after the tournament. But I do want to run an event on Rogsai. Mm -hmm. Rogsai. Yeah, that's it. That's it for the for the meta breakdown. I think uh, you know it's it's, it's an run. interesting one. I think we definitely shook things up and showed the world what Rakdos could do. I think that's it. Um, the only last thing that we could mention is we'll we'll flash up the uh, the top deck. Uh, leaderboard right now because there has been a good number of events now and there has been some a little bit of ship uh, a little bit of shift there um you are well now now you're in the top 10 i was gonna get to that let's get to that okay okay, okay, okay. So you're okay. At, you're at number three now dude number three i was already at number three i've been at three yeah but now i broke the top 10 so i'm i am in 10th place right now with 345 points 
Boom, baby. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. So, yeah, it's annoying. Like I keep I keep top fouring all these online events. But you only get credit for uh, one. You only get yeah. you only get credit for one. So I really need to win one to get a point boost. They're all not doing anything for me from the top deck perspective. Yeah. But it was helpful when I, I top fouring that in person event um, last weekend, which was pretty helpful for it. But yeah. Yep. I do one. But the, the season is still young, so there's plenty of plenty of plenty of room to to make your mark on the leaderboard. I mean, if you go to oh, you know the top fifty or so, there's like you're in the like hundred hundred and forty point range so that's very easy to get to so there's still plenty of room to get into this in the invitational so you know get out there if your lgs is not on the, the circuit already like push on them get them in it um earn some points yeah and i do want to bring up as well um we'll just post the link in the description we're not going to talk about it but i do think it's something that people should read um, obviously there's a lot of been a lot of issues about cheating we we talked about it in our last podcast alexander lien who is currently number four on the top deck leaderboard um wrote up a document regarding how some of the recent cheating uh, situations have been handled and his opinions on them. I personally agree with a lot of what he said, and so it, we're not going to talk about it, but if you would like to read that document, we are going to put it in the description below, a link to it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And also in the description below, you will find all the links to all of our stuff, uh, our Patreon, uh, the Spotify, uh, our Discord server. Um, all of that will be in the description below, as well as our deck list from the tournament. Um, you know, uh, so please check all that stuff out. Enjoy it. Um, and what was your, uh, what was your, what was your deck list name? For ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. My, my deck list was Obnix ain't shit. Um, but it turns out Ob, Ob was pretty good. Thanks, bro. I was pretty good. I'll acknowledge it. Yeah. It turns out I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Ke Ken, uh, comedians review video where he has to read <laughs> your deck Obnix ain't shit and then talk about me one place higher <sighs> than you. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I decided to make a duplicate of my Ob's palace list that is on the database. LOL. Um, I, <laughs> and I renamed it. Um, I'm known for Kenan where my strategy is called grind them in the dust. And so for this tournament, I named my deck leave them in the dust. Nice. Because we're going fast this time, nice, baby. Nice. So, uh, and just so you guys know, uh, our, our Patreon has been pretty fun. We do have an insider general chat. They've already gotten to see some sneak previews of like the design for our playmat and such, um, as well as some other insider information. So if that's something that interests you, definitely check it out. Super helpful to support the channel. Help us keep producing more content. Help us keep producing better content. We do want to get into gameplay and stuff. Yes. Uh, we just need to get a little more, a little more going there before we can like appropriately start getting that done realistically. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, don't you don't have to, but everything is super, super helpful if you feel so inclined. Yep, yep. And uh, I guess the last thing is you do do coaching. You want to talk about your coaching real quick and then take us out? Yeah, I do. I do offer CDH coaching. Uh, I had multiple people in this last tournament, uh, actually, who were some of my some of my coaches, my bonder prodigies, my disciples. <laughs> um, and uh, sadly, none of them were hit top 16 this time. I've, ha I've had a pretty good track record over the last few tournaments of like people I've coached hitting top 16 for the first time, which has been like awesome to see that kind of development. Um, everyone I coached that was in this past tournament, they all got at least one win. Like multiple of them were at seven points. They were in win and ins. One of what two people I coached were actually in a win and in against each other and lost to the same uh, Thrasio Joshimaru deck where like it, the Kinnon deck was really, really close to having it. And it was super cool. This was this guy's first tournament up on Kinnon. He'd literally been playing the deck for less than a week and we like had an emergency coaching session to get him ready for it. Uh, it's super cool to see him have success with that right away. I, I really, I, I love seeing people develop and like have success after coaching. It's, it's really rewarding for me as well. So that's super cool. But I think that's everything for today. Today. So, I mean, thank you so much for listening to the Colors or Crutch podcast. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. We're trying to get to a thousand. As always, my name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined by the Florian Man, the guy who's brought that deck everything it's ever had, Max P, the Kindly Lord. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you guys next time. <laughs>